things that are going to increase um, housing options within the city. Um, I did ask Mr. Morrow about the accessibility of the units he intends uh, to put in place and he does intend to make them accessible. So good news all the way around and um, we thanked him for, for his development of this property. Excellent. Any questions from Council? Okay, seeing none. If you wish to be notified of Council's decision, please contact Owen Hutton at City Hall. Could I have a motion to adjourn, please? Moved by Councillor Reeve, seconded by Councillor Plummer. All those in favour? Okay, we are now adjourned. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting to order of the Planning and Development Committee for Tuesday, June 7th, 2022. Do I have any disclosures of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof? Seeing none, I'd move on to the approval or amendments of this evening's meeting agenda. Councillor Abdallah, Deputy Mayor Gervais, all in favour? And that's carried. Thank you. Next up, the approval of minutes of the Planning and Development Committee of May 3rd, 2022. Moved by Councillor Plummer, seconded by Councillor Jackno. All in favor? That's carried as well. Do I have any business arising from those minutes? Seeing none, we'll move on to item six, delegations, and we're pleased this evening to have with us uh, co-chair of the uh, Diversity Advisory, Advisory Committee, um, Garland Wong, as well as our staff member, Elijah McEwen. So, Elijah, do you want to start this off? Sure. Uh, thank you, Councillor Reedy. Uh, so the Diversity Advisory Committee was formed in early 2021 to provide advice and recommendations uh, to the Planning and Development Committee uh, related to issues regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, and provide advice to the city on actions that can be taken to ensure Pembroke uh, is a more welcoming, uh, safe, and diverse uh, city for everyone here in this community. Uh, so I'm pleased to uh, have with us uh, and introduce to everyone here tonight, uh, committee co-chair Garland Wong, who is going to uh, present an update on the committee's uh, actions uh, throughout the past year and a half and where uh, this committee is going moving forward as well. Good evening, Councillor Reevy and all members of the Planning Development Committee. As you know, my name is Garland Wong and I'm the co-chair of the City of Pembroke Diversity Advisory Committee. So the committee, the origins and makeup. The Diversity Advisory Committee was formally approved in January 2021 after the Mayor's Diversity Roundtable was created in the fall of 2020. So the committee was composed of citizen appointments, one representative from the Gonquins of Pequotnagon First Nation appointed by the Chief and Council, one representative from the Local Immigration Partnership or a similar organization that works towards forwarding the goals of inclusion and diversity in Pembroke. We had up to two members of council, one of which is a member of the Pembroke Police Services Board. 
The following are resource appointments which will help guide the Diversity Advisory Committee but not be members of the committee. We had one representative from the Renfrew County District School Board, one representative from the Renfrew County Catholic District School Board, one representative from the Gonquin College Pembroke Campus that works with international students at the college. So the, for, for the current term, uh, the committee is co-chaired by Suli Adams and myself. So what we've done to date, we've, um, we recommend a land acknowledgement be delivered before all city council and committee meetings. We conducted survey and virtual round table to allow for BIPOC and LGBTQ2S plus communities to share experiences, concerns, and ideas. We also held a town hall with community and local stakeholders to present and discuss results of survey and round table. Results showed prevalent cases of discriminations in many different settings towards BIPOC and LGBTQ2S plus communities living in Pembroke and demonstrated the need for an action plan to, to strategically handle ongoing issues. We recommended to, to committee to cover the existing Margaret Duville and her mission mural and commission two new murals, one dedicated to indigenous culture and history, another dedicated to BIPOC and LGBTQ2S plus diversity in the region. The operations committee voted to keep the ex existing mural but commissioned a new mural dedicated to indigenous culture and history. We recommended staff create sections on city website for indigenous resources, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and newcomers to the region. We developed temporary diversity garden at waterfront with goal of larger, permanent installation to showcase different seeds of diversity. We developed a regular column in the Pembroke Observer and News, which was, which was uh, uh, had the title Di Diversity or Diversity of Pembroke to share different cultural stories and perspectives. So key items moving forward. So moving to the last several months of this council term, the Diversity Advisory Committee is looking to leave an impact with the following key items. Development of a community multicultural meeting slash safety place. The committee would like the city to leverage local partnerships and opportunities to develop a regular safe place for people of different cultures to come together to gather. For example, library, school boards, Algonquin College, rinks. Training for city councillors and staff. Develop training and policies for council and staff, particularly those in leadership positions. Among specific training recommendations, committee recommends council and directors participate in a Kairos blanket exercise offered by the Circle of Turtle Lodge. So the blanket exercise is based on using indigenous methodologies and the goal is to build understanding about our shared history as indigenous and non-indigenous peoples in Canada by walking through pre-contact, treaty making, colonization, and resistance. Everyone is actively involved as they step onto blankets that represent the land and into the role of First Nations, Inuit, and later Métis peoples. By engaging on an emotional and intellectual level, the blanket exercise effectively educates and increases empathy. The exercise always concludes with a sharing circle. So key items move, move for also. Development of a diversity, equity, and inclusion action plan. <coughs> Excuse me. In the committee's, in the committee's term of reference, the duties and responsibilities state the committee shall provide advice and make recommendations to the Planning and Development Committee on the development and updating as required of a diversity, equity, and inclusion action plan. Committee staff resource person Elijah McEwen will provide a report on the status of the action plan development.
Thank you for that, Garland. Um, it's been a busy uh, year and a half for sure. Now I'll open um, the floor up to anybody that has questions. Uh, Your Worship. Uh, just a comment in regards to the land acknowledgement. Uh, what has happened is, so I have now completed, if you wish, the circle. I've spoken to the circle of Turtle Lodge, uh, uh, Chief uh, Jocko, and also went before the diversity committee. And uh, so what will happen now is, so what will happen now is the, uh, the uh, as far as the council is concerned, will be coming before council, but also this means we have to change our procedure bylaw as well. So staff will work on that. So it will be it will come before council, uh, either at our next meeting or our, our meeting in July. So we are moving ahead with it now that we've gone through. So thank you, thank you for the help with that. Thank you. Any other any questions, Councillor Abdallah? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Garland, thanks for all the, the great uh, volunteerism and dedication that you and Sue Lee and the committee are doing to promote and change diversity in Pembroke. We really appreciate that. I just have a question about the, uh, the room, the dedicated room. Would this be a dedicated room or a room that would be designated that people could go to at the library or the college to feel safe? What's your vision for that? What, what did the committee envision? Presently, there, there is, they are using the library, but you know, we want to find another alternative so that you know, uh, sometimes there's pressure put on the library. Like for example, what just happened on the weekend, what the library went through for when, they, when they were involved with the Pride, Pride weekend. You know, we, the, the library has been a fantastic uh, place for to to uh, allow people to feel safe, but we just thought it'd be place another place where where you know it takes the the focus off of the library. I mean they have been great, so it's it wouldn't if we can find a dedicated place where where uh, groups can go and feel they they can go there and feel safe uh, if they want to go and host you know dance night or something with their cultures, it it would be a place to go. So and if if people come to Pembroke. Uh, they would, they would, ha they can, you know, ha have a, there'd be maybe a number, a phone number f for that place if they had to call, leave a, leave a, a um, you know, a question or anything that we can help out. Because, I mean, we're, it's not just for the present residents, it's for the international students, for newcomers coming to the area. So we, we want to be as accessible as possible. Mm -hmm. a and we just thought it, it would allow just a, another avenue for, for uh, people to reach out if they needed assistance right. because uh, you know uh, as you know there's there's always people coming and going and, and if we can get a place where, where it would be dedicated it would make it easier but right now i yeah. know it, it's a challenge so we we, just we we are in the process of looking in we are going to build a new aquatic complex and mm -hmm. one of the one of the options is a meeting room a gallery slash meeting room so that could possibly be um an area you know not permanent like they could go to uh and it could be a shared shared area, mm -hmm. so that's one option we can talk about. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we got to start somewhere. So right. at least, you know, you start small. Right. And, and, and as you know, the, our our committee is is, is new also. Mm -hmm. So we're just trying to get ideas and pass it on to the planning right. planning and development committee to see what you know, to get ideas from from yourselves also. So yeah, okay, no, that's great. And I I love the uh, the, the recommendations are are great. Uh, I participated in a blanket exercise with the. Pembroke, um, the Renfrew County District School Board. It's an excellent uh, resource and learning experience and uh, fully support the, this proposed study. Thank you. Thank you, Elijah. I think you wanted to jump in. Yeah, um, and not to get ahead of our next item here, but I think that this is something that's within an action plan, seeing what the community um, would want in terms of what that space would actually require um, and how frequently uh, that space would be required, what, uh, um, what would be required in terms of it. What, are we talking a small room, a large room? Um, in terms of what existing spaces do we have that can accommodate that, um, I think would go a long way 
um, into knowing what we can already um, assist with in terms of what we have. And so uh, doing some planning around that within an action plan, I think that's something that would go a long way for us. And so that would be one piece of that would be seeing things that we maybe have a vision of doing and figuring out how to actually enact that based on what the community wants because perhaps we have a couple people who have something they want to do but don't know what the community necessarily wants and so it's a matter of reaching out to the community to see do you even want this and if you do how do you see that actually being put into action thank you councillor jack now Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Garland. I know the uh, Diversity uh, Committee has done a lot of great work. <clears throat> I did have a number of calls uh, during the uh, Pride Festival in regards to an issue uh, with a story reading time at the library. Um, I did go on online to uh, to see, you know, what uh, what the issue was. And, uh, and I mean, people were calling me. I know they probably called the mayor as well. But I think it's a question that has to be has to be asked. Uh, the individuals who identified themselves in the online as the storyteller at the library, the original name was Toxic Waste. And, you know, when you see a parent seeing a name like that, where somebody's going to be reading to their children or whoever's children participate, there were some concerns. And so I had a concern myself. So I, I took it upon myself to call the chair of the library board. And... Uh, I was in contact with a couple of other counselors by email, uh, you know, to, to ask their opinion, of course, because, uh, I mean, it's just not me. And uh, apparently the website, uh, you know, was addressed and changed. So what came up now was uh, drag queen story time. So <laughs> I don't know whether the implication of a notation of, of the name implies anything for story time for children. I think it just should be. Perhaps it should have been called diversity story time. Uh, what does you know a drag queen story time have to do with telling children a story? And you know the little clip at the bottom was well, children are going to be here and encouraged to celebrate differences. I understand that. You know everyone's different, and I respect that. And also you know to understand how bullying works, etc. And you know in my mind the library was always a haven for safety when I was a child, or, and I still, is, I still think it's looked at that. But my only question is, like, why do you have to identify, to me, drag queen has an implication, you know? It has an implication. So what does that have to do with telling a story to a child? That, that's my question. And I, I believe in, uh, you know, diversity. I believe in respect for one another. But is that quotation mark name promoting the pride group or is it promoting children's reading time? That's my question. And I, I hope people will consider it. And I hope that in future the library chair or the board chairman and their members will look at that. When people come to this council to make a presentation, they just don't show up. You know, they have to submit uh, what they want to know. They submit it through our CAO so that we can be prepared. And uh, obviously, many parents in the community had a concern. So I'm voicing that concern. I know the Pride Festival Sorry. went enormously well. There was a lot of people on Prince Street. I was down. I talked to many of them. They were having a ball. Uh, but my question was this one. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jack No, for your opinions, um, observations. I think that perhaps the the Diversity Advisory Committee might welcome you to um, a meeting to have that discussion at one of our future meetings. I'll leave that with the, the chair to consider um, that in future. No problem with that. Okay. I want to work for the community. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we have Councillor Lafrenia would like to ask a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I too would like to find out what that topic how that topic is discussed at the next committee meeting. Oh, my mic's on. It's on. Oh, you pushed it down. Sorry. That's okay. Sorry. 
Okay, so I would, I too would like to see that conversation because I guess when it comes to children, it's an extra sensitive thing with everyone and whose job is it to educate them on diversity and what that means and et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, that was not my question until Councillor Jack No commented. Um, my question is, this space, are you talking about like a permanent meeting space or a space for events or like a dance or, <laughs> so I'm, I'm picturing all kinds of things. At the time, you know, we, we thought of a certain hall that, that we might be able to use. Um, you know, it, 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 we had so many discussions on, on, on what, like, like you just said, it was a val it's a valid question. And, and again, I, that's something we'd have to reach out to in the members and, and, and what, and what the groups that, that would be involved would be interested in. Um, you know, it, it, as you know back, if history, if you remember history where, where we had all these, we had different groups in Pembroke. Uh, I was involved with the, at, at that time, the Chinese Association group. We had the Greeks, we had the, you know, we had all these different groups. So, I mean, that, that'd be something that we'd have to reach out to see if they'd be interested. Like, like Elijah said that, you know, we, we'd have to see what, what they want. And, and, but it was just, at least it, it gets us talking so that's something I'd have to, you know, bring back and, and, and see what, uh, speak to the groups to see. But I just thought we'd bring it up to see what, what you, how you feel about it. Well, my opinion on that is I can see, so meeting space or a new resident trying to reach out to get involved in the committee or to express some concerns, I could see us having, um, you know, a, a link online where they could email members of the committee to ask questions and, and that type of thing. So we definitely could facilitate that. When it comes to events, I don't think it's any different because we should all be on the same playing field. If they want to run an event, they should just find a, a place and book it. Um, I think the problem on the weekend was different because it was in a public library, it was dealing with children. So I don't think you know, if you wanted to have a dance for a LGBTQ, they book a hall, just like any other group. And then they fundraise or they sell tickets at the door. So I think I'm just trying to separate what exactly you're requesting, but I would definitely see that the city should facilitate something online where they can reach out, you know, definitely. No, no that's, that's good, that's good. Thank you, I think Elijah wanted to, uh, to contribute to that. Yeah, I do just wanna clarify that just so uh, the committee is clear and the, any public that is watching as well is aware. We do have that available for um, anyone who does want to reach out to uh, the Diversity Advisory Committee. That is available on our website um, and they can be reached at diversity uh, at pembroke.ca. Um, and so that is available on the diversity, equity, and inclusion page. They can email directly on there uh, or write at that email as well. Thank you, Elijah. I think as well when we, we have discussions surrounding um, one of the events for Pride Week that took place at the library on the weekend, um, I, it's my understanding that the event was e arranged by both um, PFLAG and the Pride Committee. It wasn't a, a Pembroke Public Library event. They were asked if they would be available to host the event. So just so that we're clear on that, uh, Deputy Mayor Gervais. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so you're correct on that comment, but uh, really the reason why I had my hand up was to thank uh, Garland for making the presentation tonight. Of all the presentation, the takeaway that I have that I'm most pleased with is the education piece. Uh, we know that when we're elected to council, we receive AODA uh, compliance uh, led, uh, training. We receive water regulation training. I know as a lawyer, I receive EDI annual training. Uh, so it, it's it's just what has to, to happen. So I'm happy to see that uh, uh, seemingly what the recommendation is, is that uh, all city council and staff would receive that training. So that's the takeaway out of the uh, out of the presentation that I uh, that I take away from it and very pleased with that part. Thank you. Uh, your Worship. 
One comment in regards, and I think we'll find out in July, we know the demographics of the city have changed since the last census. So again, it's a case of thanking uh, uh, the diversity committee because it has been, you know, two years, and we, I think we're going to notice, or we will see, that the demographics in our city have really changed. And I think what's important, at least this council keeps striving for, is that that we continue to be a welcoming, but we also the important things be inclusive and a safe community, and we are doing that. So I want to thank you and your committee. You know, so so being transparent and that that people have a chance to you know to go and speak. But and uh, and I know being a diverse committee, it uh, it sometimes is difficult. So I really appreciate the time and the volunteers that you're putting into it. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and part of our challenge is our group is so diverse, and, and it's uh, some of our meetings are it's so so widely spread out, but we always seem to come to a, a, a common goal. So, uh, you know, it's nice that we can bring it here and, 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 let, and, and let you know what's, what's going on. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us tonight and bringing us an update, and we look forward to future updates and, um, and hopefully uh, some really great progression. Thank you very much. Okay, well, we're, we'll move on to our new business um, this evening. And first up is the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Action Plan. And we have uh, Elijah to, um, to bring us his report. Thank you. Well, as Garland alluded to uh, during the presentation, uh, we are seeking to progress here with uh, a diversity, equity, and inclusion action plan uh, to um, put all of this together to create a roadmap for the city here. Uh, and so the Diversity Advisory Committee is recommending that the Planning and Development Committee award the funding and facilitation of a diversity, equity, and inclusion action plan to provide strategic planning for the municipality to with Shayla Inc in the amount of $9,900. Uh, so uh, Garland did uh, reference that uh, this does fall under the terms of reference for the committee uh, to actually uh, develop and update uh, that uh, action plan. And we did uh, see um, this actually come up when we did do uh, our own qualitative and quantitative research last year uh, within our survey and our roundtable. The need for uh, this um, action plan present itself um, in terms of creating some kind of um, future planning. Uh, so that's where this comes from. The Diversity Advisory Committee has voiced their support for enacting this plan to provide guidance for council, staff, and external stakeholders uh, with regards to both short and long-term action uh, related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, so the action plan development would focus on assessing and reviewing the current state of the organization. Uh, we're talking about some policy review as well in there, and then the external community as well before working with community members, stakeholders, staff, and council in planning sessions to acknowledge what is possible in the short and long term. A plan would be developed over this summer to be tentatively finalized in September or October. Uh, so we did reach out to various consultants uh, and quotes were uh, received uh, from experienced consulting firms and we received suitable proposals from Lockhart Facilitation, Mackay Consultants, and with Shayla Inc. And after all of those proposals were received, uh, the Diversity Advisory Committee uh, elected to recommend the proposal from with Shayla Inc. Uh, based on uh, the team's knowledge of Pembroke, the Ottawa Valley, and specifically rural communities, uh, based on the fact that they are indeed based here in uh, the Pembroke area. The firsthand experiences that several members actually had working with the company and being able to speak to uh, them and their team. The passion that came through in their proposal in addition to the work with data. 
uh, the diverse qualifications and backgrounds of the well-rounded team, uh, as well as the cost effectiveness of the proposal, which came in lowest of uh, all of the proposals when all was said and done. Uh, so uh, the financials of everything, um, in the 2022 budget, uh, this action plan was uh, approved at a uh, costing offset with grant funding, but there was a $10,000 budget line uh, set aside for diversity and inclusivity programming. Uh, we are, uh, the Diversity Advisory Committee is recommending that that $10,000 uh, be utilized uh, to fund this action plan uh, following uh, unsuccessful grant applications. Uh, we tried throughout this year and now uh, moving forward, we are looking to utilize that $10,000 uh, to fund this um, action plan. And so that action plan, as we mentioned, comes in at $9,900 from with Shayla Inc. Thank you, Elijah. So I'm looking for any questions, comments, uh, Councillor Abdallah. Thank you, and Councillor Frenier, seconding. Thank you. Councillor Jackno. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to, uh, to, Mr. to Mr. McEwen, uh, the Mackay Consulting Group, I, can you give me a little background on, are these local people, or what background, or what, what experience do they have? Uh, no, they are based out of Toronto. Toronto, okay. Um, yeah, they do have a significant uh, background as well. Um, specifically in diversity, equity, and inclusion um, plans uh, and consulting. Um, that was the route we went with trying to find uh, relevant consultants, that they had a um, significant background in uh, both uh, putting together strategic plans uh, as well as a background in diversity, equity, and inclusion to be able to put that together for us, uh, as well as being able to come in at a reasonable budget number. And so that Mackay Consultants number came in at a uh, number above as uh, that we ended up seeing. Um, and so it was based on that as well as the uh, local factor um, and some uh, qualifications um, from the proposal from with Shayla uh, that the diversity committee felt really pushed it uh, above. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions before I call the vote? All right, so we have motion on the floor to um, accept the recommendation and all in favor, and that is carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Mrs. Sorio is going to be uh, Mrs. Sutherland this evening. Welcome, Mrs. Sorio. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. So um, on May 31st, the Community Improvement Panel met and all members were present. One application was reviewed from Sleepwell Property Management, who is the owner of 75 Pembroke Street West, and that's the former Valley Vape location. So the application was for the Downtown Heritage Facade Improvement Grant, and the applicant plans to install new windows and doors, do a stucco finish, and include a signboard for a future tenant. According to the Community Improvement Plan requirements, there are to be no outstanding work orders or taxes against the property, and there are no outstanding work orders or taxes on the property. There is an open building permit on this parcel, um, under which 75 Pembroke Street West falls under for upper level residential work. The building permit is in good standing and it's a ongoing progress. The application included two quotes for all works, as well as photos of previous work done to other facades in the downtown core, which serve as a plan for this facade. So according to the low quote that was provided, the facade improvements will cost 32,000 
$700, and based on the Downtown Heritage Facade Grant guidelines, 50% of the work can be reimbursed up to a maximum of $5,000. Therefore, this application is eligible for a total of $5,000 under this grant. So the Community Improvement Panel has recommended that $5,000 is granted to Sleepwell Property Management, and a resolution will be before Council this evening. Thank you. Any questions, comments? So we're going to have the resolution, resolution, so we don't need a motion. Thank you. Next item is a parking request for 527 Miller Street. Mrs. Soriel. So a request has been received from Victor Perot of 527 Miller Street to allow him to park his vehicle on the City Boulevard in front of his house. Mr. Perot purchased 527 Miller in 1990 and has had no driveway since that time. The lot is very small and does not have enough space for a driveway. His lot is only 27 feet wide, the house is approximately 21 feet wide, and there's not enough room on either side of the house to park a car. Also, the house is built close to the front property line and there's no space to park the vehicle in front of the house, as it would be parked over the sidewalk. A complaint has been received from Mr. Parrow's neighbour that he is not permitted to park on city property and has asked the city to ticket and tow Mr. Parrow's vehicle. The city has never received any complaints before regarding the location of Mr. Perrault's um, vehicle. Thus, the reason Mr. Perrault is asking for relief from the parking bylaw to allow him to continue parking on the city boulevard in front of his house at 527 Miller. The city's parking bylaw does not permit parking on the north side of Miller Street, and Mr. Perrault presently parks on the city boulevard on the north side between the sidewalk and the travel portion of the street. His vehicle is set back from the travel portion of the road and has not been an issue for city snow removal operations. Mr. Perot shovels the snow from this parking space. There is no easement or right of way registered on title to allow Mr. Perot to share the driveway at 527, or sorry, 529 Miller Street, which is his neighbor. The operations department has no concerns with Mr. Perot continuing to park his car on the city boulevard in front of 527 Miller as long as he continues not to impede snow <laughs> removal operations. It would be recommended if the committee permits this boulevard parking that an encroachment agreement be entered into with Mr. Perot. The city's encroachment agreement states that the owner of 527 <coughs> Miller Street would be responsible for the continued maintenance and repair of the parking area located on Miller Street Road Allowance. The agreement also states that Mr. Perot agrees not to hold the city responsible for any damage which may occur as a result of normal construction or maintenance of Miller Street. And the agreement would also state the city would not be liable in any way for this encroachment. And should the city require this land for any purpose, then the owner would remove the encroachment at their own expense and without delay. Um, this agreement would also state uh, that the agreement can be reviewed by the city at any time. And this agreement, if approved, would be registered on title. So committee direction is required and if the committee does direct an encroachment agreement will be entered into with Mr. Perro and a bylaw agreement could be prepared for the June 21st council meeting if that is the direction and wish of committee. Thank you for the report. Um, I'll ask for comments. Councillor Frenier. So I'm looking at a picture where I see the two homes 527, 529. So I would imagine it's the one right in front of his own residence, yeah. correct? The paved boulevard? Like uh, look, through you, some, yes, yes, it, yes. So it's it's you could. Is this the one you're looking at where you see the basket and the uh, no, no, the different one, the other I, one? There's nothing there. Okay, I think what happened was when the pictures were sent, they were um, they were sent and the the sizing was inappropriate. But this is the neighbor's house, the white house. Okay, and there's his driveway. And then Mr. Perot is not impeding the drive. Oh, there it is. Okay, so that's where mine didn't come out. Okay. So it's the yep. graveled portion in between the sidewalk and the travel portion okay. of the railway. So I have no problem um, since we only really had one person complain and it's not affecting the city operations and the fact that he does take ownership of removing the snow. So I see no problem with this personally. Thank you, Councillor Jackno. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to Ms. Sorrell. Uh, is there any uh, sight line obstruction uh, to the other neighbor when he's pulling out in the winter if the vehicle's there, if there's snow bank there? Is that why the complaint is being placed, perhaps, that he cannot see to get out safely? Uh, through you, uh, Madam Chairperson. Um, the driveway 
uh, for 529, the neighbor's uh, driveway, is, would be side by side to Mr. Perot's. So there wouldn't be a snowbank in the middle of the two because Ms. the neighbor uses that portion of the driveway as well. So it wouldn't be any sight line issues in regards to snow between the two driveways. Thank you. Mr. Plummer. Thank you. I would uh, so move we approve the uh, request to enter into an encroachment agreement with uh, Mr. Perot. Okay, and we're not really looking for a motion, just direction, but oh. if, um, if I may from the, from the chair as well, um, I've been past this, this location several times today. I don't see any issue with it. The north side of um, Miller Street is blessed with a significant amount of boulevard space, which does allow for the parking for this gentleman. Um, I really don't see it as being any different than my driveway going out to the street and going past the boulevard. So I certainly don't have any issue with it as well. So nothing further. I think, um, Ms. Soriel, we've got direction to proceed with the bylaw amendment. Thank you. And the en encroachment agreement. Next up is the amended draft plan approval conditions for the Golf View subdivision file number 47T10001. And we'll ask Mrs. Soriel to give her report. So Golf View Land Development, through their consultants JP2G, have requested a change to the amended conditions of draft plan approval for the Golf View Land uh, Development Plan of Subdivision. Phase one consists of 18 townhouse blocks for a total of 96 townhouse units. And the proposed changes are due to Bell Canada's insistence on having a blanket easement over the whole townhouse blocks. A blanket easement occurs when the legal description for the easement covers the entire parcel of land to be developed. The easement is not confined to just a portion of the land, it actually encumbers or affects the entire parcel. So that can be problematic for the owner because if there are any improvements on or other uses for the property, the easement can demand that these improvements be removed or uses stopped. So the owner of Golf View, on the advice from his lawyer, does not want the blanket easement. However, Bell Canada is insistent on this requirement. So the developer has decided not to proceed with providing Bell services for the development. Instead, he will be using other providers for communication services, such as NRTC Communications, um, for the property since they don't have the same restrictive requirements as Bell Canada. Kojiko will also be providing their services to the subdivision, so the homeowners will have the ability to choose between NRTC Communications and Kojiko. Therefore, this request would require a change to the amended conditions of draft approval. So presently, conditions 12 and 22 refer only to Bell Canada as being the telecommunications provider. The developer would like to amend these two conditions to add NRTC Communications or any other telecommunications provider along with Bell to service this site. Thus, whoever services the site would be responsible to write to the city to indicate that this service has been provided and that this complies with condition 12 of the draft plan approval. So the main change is to add NRTC communications or other telecommunications providers along with Bell to condition 12. Then condition 22 would be amended to state that prior to final approval by the city, the city would be advised by, in writing by Bell NRTC communications or any other telecommunications provider how condition 12 was satisfied. The way the two conditions are presently written, again, it only allows for Bell Canada to provide um, telecommunications to this subdivision. The Planning Act allows the approval authority, the city, to change the conditions of draft approval at any time before the approval of the final plan of subdivision. And further, the Act states that a public meeting is not required if it's felt the change is considered minor. And the Planning Department does feel this change is minor since there's no adjustment to the residential zone boundaries, there's no additional units being created, and a zoning bylaw amendment is not necessary as a result of this proposed request. Therefore, the Planning Department is recommending um, the proposed changes to the conditions of draft plan approval, and a bylaw is before Council this evening. Thank you. Any questions, comments? No? Very good. Thank you for your report. We'll have that later this evening. Moving on to our next item, which is the parking meter report. <coughs> Mr. 
So on November 16th, 2021, Council passed a bylaw permitting two hour free parking from Monday to Saturday from January 1, 2022 to July 1st, 2022 for parking meters located in the downtown core. This initiative began January 1st, 2020 and has been extended since that time due to COVID and the strains that it has placed on local business owners. The program includes the meters on Pembroke Street between McKay Street and Hink Street and the associated side streets, including Renfrew Street. Now that the deadline for this project is set to expire on July 1st, committee direction is required whether to extend the two hour free parking or return to the paid parking at the meters. Approximately 90 meters are involved and the average normal revenue brought in by parking meters is approximately $50,000 a year. The average annual revenue for parking tickets is 49,000. And the 2022 budget has been approved showing revenues for parking meters from July 1st to December 31st, 2022. So the committee was hoping a clear picture could be provided during this parking initiative um, as to how much revenue would be lost by offering two hour free parking at the meters. A true detailed representation could not be provided due to extenuating circumstances, which included COVID-19. The PBIA has indicated in their attached letter, which is dated May 24th, 2022, um, that they are not um, interested in having this particular two hour uh, free parking at the meters extended, but that they would have their summer student collect parking data and further that the PBIA would be working with a consultant to help create a parking strategy for the downtown. The PBIA is proposing to present a clear and actionable plan to Council in September of 2022. It is recommended that direction be provided by committee to ensure that city staff be part of the PBIA parking study process and this way city can provide input to ensure that, that it is a comprehensive parking strategy. While waiting for this parking strategy, the PBIA is asking at this time to have the Market Square lot and the Shamrock lot changed to free three hour parking lots. Presently, the Market Square lot, which is located between Albert Street and Victoria Street, is a two hour free parking lot with 45 spaces. The Shamrock lot, located at the corner of Pembroke Street West and Moffat, is a three hour metered lot with 12 spaces. The PBIA would like to cover these meters in the Shamrock lot and allow three hours parking for both of these lots. The BBIA has heard from customers that two hours is sometimes not enough time to complete their errands. That's the reason they would like to change these lots to three hour parking. Also during COVID-19, the bylaw enforcement department noted that the following losses in revenue other than parking meters were, um, were obtained. So there was parking permits. So during uh, COVID-19, Algonquin College's campus was closed and then opened for limited services. And the city saw a loss of revenue in 2021 for parking permits in the amount of $20,500. As of the time of the writing of this report, the city issued only seven parking permits for the Cockburn lot from September 21 to April 22. Normally, the city would sell approximately 100 permits. The bulk of Algonquin College classes will be returning in person in September 22, but many programs have changed to a hybrid model. Therefore, it can be anticipated there will not be as many students on the campus. Parking tickets. During COVID-19, there's been a reduced number of vehicles parking in the downtown core. Typically, the city generated approximately 49,000 from parking tickets annually. In 2020, we saw 29,000. And in 2021, we saw $32,700 was generated. Therefore, the city is still well below the pre-COVID pre revenues. And in regards to the parking meters, again, we normally see about $50,000 annually. And in 2020, due to COVID, as well as the two hour free parking initiative, only 11,000 was generated from the parking meters. And in 2021, 6,344 was generated. And as of the end of April 2022, $700 has been collected from the parking meters. And just so that you're aware, there are presently 253 uh, two-hour parking spaces available in the downtown core, and there's also over 600 parking spaces between the marina and the Cockburn parking lots. So based on the above information, it's anticipated that the two-hour free parking initiative saw a loss of revenue of approximately $43,565 from metered parking spaces in 2021. 
It is anticipated losses in revenue could be similar in 2022 if the parking meter project continues. Further, due to COVID-19, the 2021 budget saw a loss of revenue of approximately $36,800 for parking tickets and parking permits for a total loss of revenue in 2021 of approximately $80,365. At this point, the loss in revenue cannot be attributed to COVID since the provincial government has removed most emergency orders associated with COVID. It is anticipated there may be a loss of revenue for parking permits issued to the Cockburn lot to Algonquin College students if there is an option for hybrid classes. The loss of revenue from the 2021 Bylaw Enforcement Department budget was agreed by the Combined Committee of Council at its meeting of November 2nd, 2021, to be funded from the COVID Safe Restart Funds. It is anticipated there will be no further COVID Safe Restart Funds since these funds were used to support any COVID-related local operating need. Extending the two-hour free parking would now be seen as a parking initiative to support the PBAA that has nothing to do with COVID-19, which would be then a direct cost to the city. So based on that report, direction is required for the following items. Number one, does the committee wish to extend the two hour free parking meter initiative to the end of 2022, or does it wish to end the two hour free parking at the meters? Do you want me to go through all four or do you want to deal with one at a time? I think we'll deal with one at a time. It would be better that way. So let's start with the first one. I have Councillor Abdallah first, then Councillor Lafreniere. <clears throat> so I, I sit on the PBA, as you know, and I, sp I spoke to uh, Thea Summers, the manager today, just to reiterate, the PBA is not here tonight to ask council to extend the free to our parking. Uh, when I spoke to council a number of months ago about the parking issue, I told council that the PBA will be coming back with a comprehensive parking report and some proposals, progressive proposals for the city council to consider and staff that will move parking forward and make it even better for, for uh, residents and out of town guests to come and shop here. So they're not looking for that. Um, they are looking for the extension of number two, item two, which we'll talk about in a minute. So do you need a motion for that or? We're looking for, we're looking for direction at okay. this point. Thank you. So they're not, in, they're not interested in the number one. Okay, Councillor Lafreniere. Well, then it's a non-issue, correct? Just remove it? Right. it? That we will continue now to have the meters operating? Yeah. Okay. I think well, the, um, the permit or the plan was to end at June 30th. Was yeah, that where we're at? Okay, um, so Deputy Mayor. That's, okay, that's a done deal then. Deputy okay. Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I don't know that it's, that it's a done deal. It is this committee that, in the beginning, engaged down this road of let's do free parking in the downtown core and it's going to stimulate business and do all those different things then we got into covid which then the gears shifted and it's like okay let's do free parking in the downtown core to try and help the businesses due to the the uh, conditions on covid but it, it wasn't to my recollection the pbia that started this it's in fact this committee that initially said hey let's let's look at free parking in in the downtown core um so i was prepared to actually expecting the different committee members to be saying let's continue on with this because we we started it and, and so forth uh, and what i was going to hold up is the budget where we were budgeting for income for six months that's going to disappear and you're going to wipe out your contingency fund just trying to make up for the fact that we budgeted for it and you're not going to get the income so i'm i'm pleasantly surprised let me put it that way uh, that council or this committee is saying yeah no problem uh we you know uh, we're we're in support of uh, so could, to me it's not just about the, what the pbia wants at the end of the day it's what this committee says as well uh, so i'm pleasantly surprised because i think it's fiscally responsible to start charging again um, and as as uh, councillor abdallah mentioned uh, it's not just pembroke residents that go and shop in the downtown core you got people from whether it be you know chalk river or brown lake center wherever and they're coming here and if they're not paying for the parking uh, and we have a shortfall of monies who's picking up that tab it's our ratepayers again so i'm i'm happy <laughs> thank you i'm glad you're happy uh councillor lafreniere my memory may not served me as well as uh, the deputy mayor but i didn't remember it being initiated at this level i thought that the bia did come to us and request it so that is my memory of that and i see councillor abdallah agreeing with me however regardless of whether they wanted it or not i i was going to suggest we return to the metered 
and uh, not free parking for two hours in downtown. Uh, I agree with Deputy Mayor. It's, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, province's uh, regulations are, are dropped now. Like, so business hopefully will return. I think it has been returning to normal, slow but sure. So, uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jackno. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as we all realize, there's been a renaissance of new business and development in the downtown core. All types of new shops, uh, uh, the baby boutique or whatever. I thought, what a wonderful idea. You know, you have uh, young expected mothers from all over. Uh, what a great idea. And uh, the downtown core seems to be booming. And I don't think it's primarily because we gave them free parking. Uh, it's because there's been a resurgence of interest in business, especially after COVID. And I, I truly believe that, uh, you know, the uh, re reinstitution of the meters uh, is not of a detriment. It's to help traffic keep moving, give people a chance to get in there and shop. And, uh, you know, and uh, the money again will be returned to, you know, the BIA indirectly. Thank you. Thank you. And your worship. I agree that we move back to the two hour, um, the end, the two hour free parking. But I think it's it's really important that that message get out now uh, through communications. Otherwise, our bylaw people will be, and then we'll be in a lot of trouble. So I think the communication aspect is extremely important over the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you. So that's a uh, direction, I think, for item number one that we will return to the metered parking. Uh, so the second issue. Um, does the committee wish to permit the Market Square lot and the Shamrock lot to be three-hour free lots until the end of 2022, which will then provide the PBIA the opportunity to complete the parking study that will be presented to Council in September of 2022? Councillor Abdallah. Thank you, Madam Chair. So there's six uh, salons downtown, three aesthetic places, numerous restaurants, and what the, what the aim of the PBA is to start to get into the habit now of having the three-hour parking in the Shamrock and the Market Square so that in the winter time, when people want to come downtown and get their hair done or go out for lunch or uh, other go to the bank, two hours is not enough. So they, you can park at the marina and the Shamrock and the uh, Cockburn lot, but that's far away, you know, for the winter time. Even now, for some older folks, it, you don't want to walk that far. So it's the idea of, of doing it now and adopting it and getting people used to it. Um, the, uh, I spoke to Bethia Summers, like I said before today, and she said in the last two weeks, three people have come in to the office. They were 10 minutes over the two hour and they got a ticket. Hmm. So ticketing is fine if you're in the business of uh, relying on revenue by ticketing people. The idea of tickets is to move traffic along and remind people you can't park here. Shouldn't be relied upon as a revenue generator. The downtown core is a destination point. We want to be welcoming. The customer is always right. If there's a handful of abuse of people that abuse the system, you need to have an education program and speak to them. The PBA is willing to pay for the uh, signage, bag the meters, uh, have a digital parking map and a PR program online. They're going to do a membership campaign to tell their retailers and businesses downtown, you know, don't park here. This is for the customers. So Renfrew have a three-hour parking lot uh, limit. Perth also have it. So I always say about destination places, we want people to come to downtown. We don't want to have, uh, you know, them getting tickets if they're 10 minutes over. So three hours, two hours is not enough time, especially with all the variety of shops downtown now and uh, to do your business. And it's a wonderful place. It's growing. And anything we can do to assist them is very important. So uh, I'm in favor of the uh, three hours at the Shamrock and the market. And we're only talking uh, an extra hour. So it's not as if the city's going to lose a bunch of revenue, you know. So that's my, so you don't need a motion for that? Okay, so that's my uh, two cents on the issue. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Lafreniere. Um, I guess my only concern is I think that there's other lots that are still going to be two. Uh, so there's going to be some confusion. 
I think, about whether it's two or whether it's three signage. Um, so um, in principle, yes, I support it because I've heard this long before tonight, about three hours. They need three hours, especially any woman gets anything major done with her hair. They know that's a couple of hours. She stays for a pedicure. Well, she's over the two hours. Um, the only thing I'm concerned here is now we're giving them another lot. So Shamrock right now, we do have meters, correct? And they want to cover them. So I'm looking to return to our revenue stream in the downtown core. So I am supportive of the three hours, but I'm really not supportive of giving them another one of our metered lots because we want to return to normal. And I guess my question is the study that they're going to do would be based then on a free lot, another free lot. So I would rather see the study done with our pre-existing metered system so we can see what kind of revenue and what's going on down there. So that's just my feeling. Um, I agree with three hours, but not with giving them the shamrock. Thank you. So I'm just going to ask the question for you specifically, you would be against item two because that's well, for shamrock and double. market. Yeah, so I, I right? think that should almost be broken in two because it's different. You're giving them one that wasn't free. So that should almost be a two item point bulletin. Market square is not metered right now, it's free. So you're going to increase it to two hours, but shamrock, you're not just it's not free at all right now. So you're giving them free parking. Okay, correct? so we'll come back to that yes. once we get around the table. Thank so I've you. got Councillor Jack No next. Madam Chair, it's never taking me three hours to get my hair done. Oh. <laughs> but I am in favor of a three hour parking lot because I know when my wife goes to the hairdresser, it's not just the hairdressing procedure. It's a time to socialize and to, you know, to talk about the downtown. So the, those two designated parking areas, I think should be three, three hours. Thank you. Thank you, I have Deputy Mayor next. Uh, thank you, I, I have no issue with the three hours if the PBIA pays for the bagging. Yeah. When, when you say they pay for the bagging, I don't mean just the physical bag, whatever the revenue stream is lost, just like whenever they pay uh, on certain times when they bag a street or what have you, the PBIA picks up the tab for it. Me meaning whatever it's 12 spots or whatever and I don't know how someone calculates what the loss of the revenue is maybe Colleen uh, Miss Sorio knows what the loss is I want the loss picked up somehow not by the ratepayers so so the deputy mayor is asking about the loss of revenue for the shamrock lot which is metered is PBIA prepared to to pay for that loss of re revenue is there a calculation that can happen to figure that out in addition to the bagging uh through you we could figure it out like a, an estimate um i don't have that estimate this evening though for you um but it is only 12 spaces so that i i, I would worry that if we did look at another lot then there's more spaces there in another lot as well so and and it's just a project until the end of the year um, just to um, until the the parking report is 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 brought forward. Okay, that's good to know, Deputy Mayor. Just, just to follow up, because that particular lot, in terms of its location, and that's generally the lot that I park in, by the way, uh, is the, is I uh, noticed an extremely busy lot. Either they're going to Ulrich's or they're heading over to the Candle Place or they're doing whatever. It's an extremely you're lucky to get a, a spot at that particular lot usually um so all i'm trying to do is ensure that uh, i understand the three hours and so like councillor jackano it doesn't take me three hours to get my hair done either so um i don't feel that pain but if it takes three hours and i can understand why it takes some three hours so i have no issue saying these two lots are three hours uh and it helps out i just don't want to see the loss of the revenue stream to the city of pembroke that's it No, I agree with number two, and I think the important part of that is that not, my assumption is that it's going to be a comprehensive parking study, which is essential, I think, for the city, and staff will be involved in it. I think that's essential as well, but uh, I don't have a problem with, with this through the, the end of 2022. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Plummer? I agree with the Deputy Mayor that if we're going to be bagging meters that we're going back to meter parking and we're going to be bagging a meter lot that typically would correct uh, collect revenue there should be some sort of compensation by the PBI okay so what we might be able to do here I'll 
Councillor Abdallah, I'll hear yours first. Well, we're talking 12 meters. We're talking until the end of the year. We're, the PBA pays $22,000 to the city of Pembroke for parking, free parking on Saturdays, Christmas time. So, you know, that's a lot of money. And they pay a lot of taxes, the, the business owners and property owners down there. So this is only till the end of the year, until we get the, comp the study present uh, before council. So I think it's a bit, uh, you know, they, they employ local people, they pay taxes, generate revenue for the city. People come to downtown from out of town here. So we're only talking 12, meet 12 parking meters. So, I, you know, charging them for this period of time, I don't think that's uh, necessary. And so we got to look at the big picture here. Thank you. Okay, so it, I, it seems like committee is okay with Market Square, going with the three hours, bag them, or just signage and three hours free parking. So I think what we'll need to do is for Shamrock is to take a vote on uh, whether we allow free parking till the end of the year or if the other side of it would be that three that hour three hour yeah until the end of the year right so that they can complete their study um uh, or do we want the pbia to to pay some remuneration on one <laughs> councillor friend here final question what does bagging the meters at shamrock parking lot have to do with the study like, what's that got to do with doing the study? <laughs> I'm going to have to give that to yeah, Mrs. Sorio. What's it got to do with, are they going to park there for free and they're going to talk about the study or I don't know. I don't see how they're in linked. Well, the, Dalla, are you going to respond? By doing the bagging the meter and having the free three-hour free three parking there, they're going to be interviewing customers and businesses and seeing what effect that has and get customers' opinions, and that's part of the study. And that's, that's the purpose of that. So it's a comprehensive study, and it's uh, gauging support and interest and working at all the kinks of the issues. Like, what is the issue of downtown parking? You know, we've never really done a comprehensive study. Do we need better uh, technology with iPad and iPhone and, and Android? To, tick, to keep track of all the cars that are two hours or the parking meters. So it's all comprehensive. Can I respond to that? Um, I'd just like to add to that, if yeah. I could, uh, through you, Madam Chairperson. Um, the fact is that they, they feel that there's a need from the clients and from the people, the users of downtown, that there is a need for three hours. So they're asking for these two lots at this point to, as a bridge for, to accommodate that need. And then we'll see what the parking study says. But they see that this is imminent, that they need these, these two parking spaces. And also, just on an aside, there is the marina that offers all day free parking too. But again, you know, if somebody's older, you know, it, it, it is a walk. And during the summer months, the Cockburn lot also offers all day free parking um, from May 1st to the end of August. So, so there is other options as well. Okay, so thank you. So I'm just gonna call the question, um, who is in favor of, in the Shamrock, Shamrock lot, having free three hour parking till the end of this year? If, raise your hands. So, so that will be carried, that will be direction. Thank you. So then um, our third issue was based on the direction for the first two. We're good with that? So I'm good with that. Excellent. And then finally, the fourth one, and I don't imagine anybody's going to be uh, against that, would be that city staff would be involved in the, uh, the parking study. Everybody's nodding their heads. I think oh. Terry would like to yes, add. Yes, Mr. Lapierre. Yeah, no, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, we do have a question from staff. Uh, with respect to this, just to point it out, and of course, uh, committee direction is committee direction. We'll follow it, but uh, we're we're just wondering, with respect to the the statement that the PBIA is saying that they've they're working with a consultant to help us create a comprehensive parking strategy for downtown. Excuse me, for downtown. Uh, typically, that would be the role of the municipality, 
to do such strategies and comprehensive reviews, including getting feedback from stakeholders, including the downtown, and that is, is how it's been done in the past. There has not been, a, and I heard Councillor uh, Abdallah's comment, and I definitely agree with him, that there has not been a comprehensive parking study downtown for years and years and years. Colleen and I would recall that there was one done probably in the 1990s, and they looked at every parking lot and said, how many spaces are, you know, are available and what is the utilization rate and things like that. That was when a lot of uh, downtown uh, merchants were saying that we needed more parking. And as I recall, it was determined that it was something like 56 or 54 percent utilization of all the spaces that we had at that time. But my only point is that typically it would be the municipality that would do such a study because uh, we're unsure what the terms of reference is for this consultant and what you know, what they're hoping from that consultant, and then they're bringing it back to council. As I read here, they want to present it to council in September. So we're, we just want some clarification is if committee and council feels that's the role of the PBA to do that. And the, the immediate thing we were asking on this report was because we did not see any role for the municipality in this a comprehensive review that they were doing so we said somebody from staff should be participating on this we don't know is there anything that's going to deal with the implications uh, we're hearing here about the financial implications of any of the recommendations i.e. who's going to pay for this or is it just based on the fact that it's important to downtown there's a number of questions that staff would have but the primary one is is that the role that council sees the PBA to provide it uh, you know to provide it recommendations and to conduct comprehensive reviews of this nature. Okay, very valid concerns. <laughs> um, I've got Councillor Abdallah, then Councillor Lafreniere. Well, certainly we can clarify that with the PBA, and the city would, would be involved. It, it, um, it was more of a study for downtown parking and to come to council, this committee, with a proposal and I some ideas. That's what it was more for. But we can get further clarification from the manager. That's fine. If that's what committee would like. Yeah, the okay. Staff is just raising it as a matter. Yep, thank you. Council Lafreniere. Well, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Lapier, for bringing up that point. Because I think that if we were co conducting a study or you know a parking study, it may look a little different. Because we would be looking at revenue and should we even be bother, bothered, bothered to have someone uh, enforce and collect money out of the meters. But undeniably, when they Amrock and say, first big check mark now, like I would have rather see status quo And great, we'll continue to take your quarter. So that's why I questioned that. And so I would be interested in see what angle this parking study takes. Because if it's customer service, well, we know <laughs> what it's going to be, right? Nobody wants to walk from the waterfront up to downtown. So anyway, that's it. Thank you. Deputy Mayor? Simply to say that if the PB, uh, who am I to stop the PBIA if they want to hire a consultant, spend money, and and uh, analyze things from their perspective. However, having said that, when it comes to this committee, my expectation is with staff involvement, but still when it comes to this committee, my expectation is we are gonna receive a staff report uh, and uh, that all of us around the table will be very critical, I would hope, of whatever study comes forward uh, and uh, that if it's uh, um, analyzing it from our perspective then. So yes, if it's a customer service perspective and everyone wants it for free, which I suspect is, is what they're going to want. Yeah. The value I'm going to put on the report is probably a whole lot less than if the City of Pembroke staff was doing it and looking at it from a, a total perspective. And it may be that it's, thanks for the report, we're tabling it because now we're going to do ours, which just means we're hiring two consultants to do the same job. But that's what it is. Thank you. Councillor Abdallah, last one. Last one. Well, I think the key here is working together in a cooperative way to get more people to shop downtown and in Pembroke. So whether the study is done by the PBA, they will be talking to the city to clarification, and it'll all work out fine. And we'll have more people shopping, coming to Pembroke from out of town to shop, 
and local people shopping local downtown. And Mr. Lapierre. Just some staff, very briefly. Certainly, staff would have no issues, and we don't believe the council would have, with respect to a customer satisfaction survey or review. The only thing that stuck to us was their, their language when they say they want to, cre to help them create a comprehensive parking strategy, whereas the parking lots are the preview of the municipality and not the downtown, so it's a little different than customer satisfaction survey. That's, that's what sort of stuck out to us. I wonder if one of their questions when they're interviewing the parkers and shoppers, if, if one of their questions were, you know, would you like free parking but see an increase in your taxes for loss of revenue? So, I mean, you know, there's going to be uh, probably some input from the city as to how this study is going to manifest. So, thank you. That You've got your direction? Is that? <laughs> thank you. Next up is the zoning of city Pembroke waterfront lands. Mrs. Soriel. In conversations between the former mayor, Terry McCann, and current mayor, Ms. Uh, mayor LeMay, it was discussed that council may wish to consider the zoning and official plan designation of a portion of the waterfront lands to be changed to reflect their actual use. So the present zoning of the hatch lands that's part of your um, agenda package is uh, central commercial-21 flood fringe. This zone permits a variety of commercial uses such as retail, eating establishments, hotel, laundromats, health club, place of entertainment. And the present and proposed use of the hatched area includes the Kiwanis walkway, amphitheater, playground, and the proposed new arboretum. Since these lands are mainly used for uh, open space purposes, it has been suggested that these lands be redesignated in the official plan from central commercial to open space and that they be rezoned to open space to recognize their actual use and intended use of always being land for parkland purposes. Further, it's been requested that this area be renamed to Pembroke Waterfront Park. The area between Albert Street and Alexander Street has been known as Centenary Park, so this could cause some confusion. By renaming the waterfront area to Pembroke Waterfront Park will ensure a name that is easily identifiable to the public. The cost of a rezoning and official plan amendment is $1,200 plus HST. However, this is a city initiative, initiated um, application, so the fee would be waived. There would also be a cost for two notices in the weekly Pembroke Observer. plus HST. So committee direction is required and if the committee recommends proceeding with the rezoning and redesignation of the portion of the city waterfront lands and a notice of public meeting for the rezoning and official plan amendment would be placed in the newspaper and public meetings would be held in July and August. Uh, a bylaw would then be brought before council for approval and also direction is required to rename the waterfront area to Pembroke Waterfront Park. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Plummer. Okay, there's a, there's a few things I have uh, issues. Uh, I agree with some and I don't with other ones. Obviously where the amphitheater is and the walkway, we're not going to be, I think, in any foreseeable future redoing anything there. That's going to remain an open spot. It's been there for years. And I understand zoning that section as uh, open. Concern is blankets uh, labeling the rest of the parking lot. There's, I know there's a playground structure, and it, I know there's a proposed amphitheater or uh, arboretum coming. But what if we get someone uh, change our minds in the future, where it says someone comes in and says, "Idea, we're going to put a restaurant. We're going to do something on that area a parcel." You know, we can't always bet on the future of somebody doing something on. If they do something there, uh, we're going to lose a lot of parking. So there may be needed to expand the parking lot on the other side. I'm just uh, strongly against rezoning uh, that noose, that immediate section. Open space. I'm a, no, no issues with the amphitheater section, but I still think we can't, um, you know, once we rezone it, that's one thing that we may not get back in the future, and I think it's important to hold on to that. Change it if we want to, but I certainly would be strongly voting against changing that zoning. 
Uh, Your Worship. Um, in regards to, uh, I think, as council, we've always looked at the going to go in now. Here is that, uh, I think, from the municipality point of view, that open space is so important. Uh, and, and I think the way uh, that we're looking at rezoning it, maybe 20 years from now, there may be somebody wants to put up a hotel or rezone it at that time. But the auditorium is going to go in as open space. I, I understand fully there's a parking lot there. But I think of, as far as rezoning the waterfront and letting it, because we all refer to it as the waterfront, um, uh, I don't have an issue at all with it. And I don't think our community has space we do have and this particular uh, zoning change, you're right, you know, would state that. So I'm, I'm in full favor of, of, uh, of doing a rezoning for this particular portion. Councillor. As designated by staff. Councillor Abdallah. Uh, thank you. I uh, fully support the designated land as open space. I will never support commercial development on that green space that is owned by the people of Pembroke and get lost. Freedom project, which the deputy mayor and I sit on, and a lot of effort and donations are coming forward, and public support is very uh, incredible for this project. There's going to be room for destination events, midways, concerts, eating evenings, and listening to music, etc. Um, people go to the waterfront; they come from all over. We've met, set, enjoy music, walk up the Qantas walkway. development of that valuable green space. We only have so much land in Pembroke, which is owned by the taxpayers and the residents, and we have to be very careful in what we do with that land. Is your mic For that land, as far as the parking lot goes, that, that is owned commercial, and whether or not something goes there is yet to be told. Um, as far as Boat trailers and that, that will be, that will have to be dealt with within that space of the parking lot or find additional space, but not on that green space. So I'm glad this came forward. And I know that the people of Pembroke, the majority of them, would welcome this being zoned open and Waterfront Park, the name. Then Councillor Jackno. I'm not opposed to this at all. I'm just kind of, so are we going to, I do believe we are marketing right now the commercial a parking lot and that property south of the Fred Blackstein. I do believe those are on the open market right now looking for people to express interest. And I do believe we worked, those two are up, are they not being marketed right now? I, I can advise that council has uh, gone out to the public mm -hmm. to seek uh, requests for uh, expressions of interest on one or yes. those locations, not both. No. So that is something that has been public and council has put out there and uh, it has asked for requests uh, for indications of interest on one or the other. Yes. No, that's what I thought. So we would have to change it. If there is anything out there public, we would have to change that, and they would only have a choice of one lot now. So that's all I'm saying is that this council did support one or the other, so we would be removing an option from the, the open market. Yeah. Um, the fact that we have the Arboretum going in there, that's wonderful. But I do believe that only takes up half of that space. Am I correct? It does, eh? Yeah. Okay. Well... I love the Arboretum, but I kind of am of the same mind of Councillor Plummer, where if we just leave it the way it is, we can do what we want anyway. Um, I like the idea of renaming it Waterfront Park. Um, love that. But I'm just not sure why we have to, um, you know, make it formal. Thank you. Councillor Jack, no. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm in favor of the open space concept. Uh, future. Parks are so important in any uh, municipal venue, whether it's a megapolis like 
New York City where you have Central Park or Hyde Park. People congregate there. And I mean, somebody had some vision years ago, especially New York City. You know, it's completely surrounded by buildings, mm -hmm. but people can still go there as a respite and to get away from the heat. And, uh, and I think it's so important to continue to uh, protect this open space. in opposition to that, but I think it was a fit. I mean, the college students help clean the place. Uh, it attracts people to the community. It gives the students a place to go, even on their lunch, you know, to uh, uh, just have a break from their studies. So it's so important. Uh, but, uh, but I understand what Councillor Plummer's saying. You know, he's a businessman, obviously, and uh, he knows the value of a dollar. But in this particular case, I think we have to look to the future of open space being good for all of the public and for our visitors and people to come here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor. I would support that uh, the area that's marked off by staff be called the Pembroke Waterfront um, and uh, that it be open space. I think it was a foregone conclusion when council said uh, that an arboretum would be permitted in there. We've seen as a committee, we've seen the plans. Uh, I know that the, uh, the committee the subcommittee, if you will, about the Arboretum has looked at uh, where the trees are going. The trees, some of them are already down there right now, about to be planted. Uh, it will be spread out over the entire area. Councillor Abdallah has made absolutely sure that the middle, though, will be free for yeah. destination. destination events. <laughs> so he's made absolutely sure. So the middle will be... Um, not hollow, but won't have any trees. Uh, <laughs> but the surrounding area will have trees. The trees are going to start going in shortly in the next week or so. And all I'm saying is that I think it's a foregone conclusion when council said, guess what? We're in favor of this, this concept. This is how we're going to develop it. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't see getting the funds and the commitment from the various people in the community, whether and everything else and then sometime later uh, having it uh, so that the zoning is okay let's cut everything down because we're going to put in whatever so I, I think it's a foregone conclusion when this committee said guess what we're putting in an arboretum and we support uh, the uh, vision and put Mr. Blackstein as the lead so I have four definite yeses that uh, which would mean that that would end five um yeah, okay. like Councillor Abdalla? So, motion that we uh, change the zone into open space and name it Waterfront Park. And yeah. Councillor Lafreniere is seconding that. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if the motion can be Pembroke Waterfront Park. Oh, yes. Sorry. yes. Apologies. Pembroke, Pembroke Waterfront Park. Park. Okay, so, so we have a mover and a seconder. All in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. And our next item is Bill 109, Changes to the Ontario Planning Act. Mrs. Oriel. So in March. A point of order, uh, Madam Chair. On the vote, I believe the, the, the call should be not all in favor, but those in favor, and then those opposed, because I don't believe everyone was in favor. Am I correct? Are you asking for a recorded vote? No, I'm asking for the wording to be changed. Uh, when you say all in favor, the wording should be those in favor because you're presuming that everyone is in favor, correct? I guess perhaps <laughs> you are right. Just a point of clarification. Okay. So, But I, I could call. Uh, I don't think the call is necessary. I just think the wording has to change in the, in the, when you're calling the question. Thank you. Thank you. On to our next item. Thank you. So on March 30th of this year, the provincial government introduced Bill 109. It's called the More Homes for Everyone Act. This bill received royal assent on April 14th before the public consultation period even ended. Some provisions are immediately in force while others will come into force on July 1st or on January 1st, 2023. So Bill 109 amends five acts, which includes the Planning Act. And the Planning Act amendments that have uh, received the most attention to date relate to a requirement that municipalities refund fees 
on a graduated schedule over time up to 100% refunds if they fail to meet statutory deadlines for decisions on zoning bylaw amendments, zoning bylaw and official plan amendments, which are currently 90 days but are going up to 120 days, and site plan applications being revised from 30 days to 60 days. So these new refund requirements would come into force on January 1st. So this amendment has been receiving a lot of controversy amongst municipalities. The planning department is dependent on receiving comments from outside agencies, including the Ministry of Transportation, Utility Companies, Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing on planning applications. Therefore, if the city does not receive these comments in a timely manner, it will be the municipality that suffers and must refund the applicant. Another amendment to the Planning Act is the requirement for mandatory delegation of approval authority to staff for site plan approval. This must be in place by July 1st, 2022. The City of Pembroke presently has this in place. Delegation authority has been given to the CAO to sign all site plan agreements after it has gone through the process and staff is satisfied that all issues have been addressed. So there will be no change for the city in this regard. However, an updated delegation bylaw would be before council at their next meeting. As well, uh, complete application requirements applicable to official plans, zoning bylaws, and draft plans will now apply to site plan applications. The municipality must first adopt an official plan policy setting out its site plan complete application requirements. Once a complete application is received, then the 60-day review period process can begin for a site plan agreement. So the city's official plan does include a section on complete applications and the planning department will have to amend the official plan to ensure that the site plans are now included to ensure that the clock doesn't start ticking until a complete application is received and further that pre-consultation meetings are strongly recommended before an application submission. Another new section to the Planning Act was added which creates an additional type of minister's order which is called the Community Infrastructure and Housing Accelerator Order. This is different from what you've heard before of the Ministerial Zoning Orders, or MZOs, but the MZOs are now going to be reserved for provincially significant infrastructure projects like transit-oriented communities. So the Community Infrastructure and Housing Accelerator Tool now permits the Minister to make a zoning order at the request of a municipality by Council Resolution. So this accelerator tool can be used to regulate the use of land and the location, height, size, and spacing of buildings and structures to permit certain types of development, and that the ministry may make this community infrastructure and housing accelerator in order to expedite certain developments. However, before <laughs> passing such a resolution, the municipality must give notice to the public and consult with persons, public bodies, and communities as the municipality considers appropriate. Within 15 days of council passing this resolution, the mini this municipality shall forward the resolution to the minister where it will make the order under section 434 of the Planning Act, and 34 of the Planning Act is rezoning. According to Bill 109, the order does not have to be consistent with the provincial policy statement, and you'll see in all my reports I say how everything has to be consistent with the provincial policy statement, nor does it have to conform and or, or doesn't have to, or conflict with um, provincial plans or official plans. So it's throwing all the planning have regard for out the window. The minister then may impose conditions on such an order and the orders prevail in the event of a conflict with other bylaws passed under section 34 of the Planning Act. So this tool is not appealable. And this amendment is also causing controversy as it's bypassing good planning principles as well as public concerns since the development proposal is not appealable. Further amendments to the Plan Planning Act allow the minister to stop the clock if more time is needed to decide on official plan matters that are subject to minister's approval, but municipalities are not permitted to stop the clock. And again, we have to give refunds. So the proposed legislation could have several unintended consequences for Ontario municipalities, which include increased provincial jurisdiction on local planning processes and decisions, penalizing municipalities for decision-making timelines that are not wholly within the control of, our, of the municipalities, 
forcing municipalities to reduce or eliminate important aspects of the review process, <laughs> including significant input on new development applications implication there may be a loss of planning department revenue at which then would impact the departmental uh, budget on formalizing the delegation authority uh, for staff for site plan agreements so that will be at the next um, council meeting and if church site plans now must provide a complete application and recommend pre-consultation meetings to planning act um, to planning application submissions, but all the other things are in place. And I just want to. Thank you for that happy report, Mrs. Suriel. You know, I thought that um, that the provincial government was supposed to be getting rid of some of the red tape if it's to their benefit. Anyway, it is what it is, and uh, we have to abide by it. Thank you, and um, all for you for this point. Our last item is this mural at the Pembroke Waterfront. Mr. Lapierre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, direction is requested regarding the site for a proposed waterfront mural in recognition of the history, culture, and traditions of the Algonquin people. A letter of request from the Heritage Mural Committee with respect to background, as a result of interest shown in, in developing an indigenous mural committee was asked to pursue the matter and to report back. So they have done that now. They have been in communications with the uh, Pickwaknagon uh, community as respect to the installation of a mural. And from their perspective, they felt that having something along the waterfront would be a uh, Our former director of Parks and Recreation, Mr. Conroy, as well as Fred Blackstein, on that the former site of the or the site of the former chapel, I would say, uh, which would be waterfront uh, trail, would be an appropriate site. Uh, and uh, Mr. Blackstein has met with them and felt that that may be a, an appropriate site as well. Uh, the proposed mural would be 16 be installed in an area there which is susceptible to flooding in a more of a, of a higher uh, ground type of situation. They felt that this, this would probably be a, uh, you know, a good site. Now, with respect to the mural itself, to this date, so the thought is that the Pickwaknagon community may fund it, may choose to fund it, or may support uh, you know, application for some third party funding, but none of that has been determined at this point in time. And they certainly would be working with that group uh, as they have already asked them for an indication of things like, uh, you know, ideas or what would be, uh, you know, what would be illustrated on such a mural or what the story would be that would want to be told. So there's been no decisions or there's been nothing with respect to that. All they're seeking now is, uh, is a comment or direction from this committee with respect to a potential site if a mural was to be developed. Thank you, Mr. Lapierre, and if I may, from the chair, I'd like to table this item um, so that it could be referred to the Diversity Advisory Committee for um, comment and possibly recommendations. Okay, thank you. And at this point, oh, yes, is that you? Thank you. All in favor, we're tabled, thank you. And our final item on the agenda is uh, the adjournment. So looking for a mover, Councillor Frenier, Councillor Plummer, we are adjourned. Thank you.
Welcome to the Finance and Min Committee meeting of Tuesday, uh, June 7th. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. So we do have one uh, slight change to the meeting agenda. We're moving item C uh, just down to the end, so it'll become the new F, and then everything else moves up. All right. So could I get a motion to approve the new meeting agenda? De Deputy Mayor and Councilor Lafreniere, those in favor? Approved. Approval of the minutes of the Finance and Min Committee of May 3rd. Councilor Lafreniere, Councilor Jackano, those in favor? Approved. Any business arising from those minutes? Seeing none. First up, Chief Sell, Pembroke Fire Department, 2021 Annual Fire Report. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so uh, this is my uh, first annual report presentation, so uh, I hope uh, it meets your, uh, your expectations. Um, so we'll start with uh, uh, 2021. Saw uh, a lot of changes both internally and externally uh, from retirements to hirings to promotions uh, to the closure of the Ontario Fire College uh, campus in Gravenhurst, and it was uh, all COVID all the time. Um, particular focus uh, from, from myself was to uh, continue to move forward along the uh, path that was uh, developed uh, with Chief Herbeck. A quick review of our organizational structure. Uh, so currently our uh, full-time staff, our average uh, uh, years of service is 16. Our actual uh, full years of service for career staff is uh, roughly 256 years. And our, um, our average service time for our volunteers is seven years. Next slide, please. So as you can see, uh, Chief Herbach uh, retired April 30th of 2021. Uh, change can uh, be difficult uh, within an organization, especially when it comes from the top. And Chief Herbach certainly left his mark on the city and the department with uh, the new fire hall. Uh, several new fire trucks, and of course, many of the staff he had a hand in uh, bringing into the organization. And of course, also in 2021, uh, we saw the retirement of Lori Corvo after her 33 years of service with the city. Other staff changes. Uh, once I became chief, as of May 1st, there was uh, openings behind me. Uh, Acting Captain Sean Morgan was promoted to captain and uh, Jason Kelly was promoted to acting captain, both effective May 1st. And both of these uh, individuals served as uh, volunteer members prior to their uh, full-time uh, career beginning. Uh, other uh, staff changes, uh, Firefighter Gibbon and Firefighter Lapierre continued on their uh, annual promotional progression towards first class. And in uh, late summer and early fall, after sifting through approximately 370 resumes, uh, we decided on a candidate to bring our complement back up to 16 members, uh, full-time members, and uh, Riley Poirier was chosen as the successful candidate. And Riley began his probationary, uh, probationary firefighter career on September 13th. Next slide, please. Uh, we ha unfortunately, we had two volunteers resign in uh, 2021, uh, Jesse Lambert and Chase Tur Turcott. They both resigned after five, five years of service. And we also had four uh, new volunteer firefighters begin responding as of uh, January 2021. Here is a breakdown of the 367 incidents we responded to in 2021. Uh, as you can see, uh, rescue makes up the large majority of our calls. And uh, that total is uh, roughly a little over 23% of our calls. So within that category, I have, uh, uh, there are motor vehicle collisions, uh, extrication, uh, home residential accidents, any type of rescue uh, requirements. Uh, this slide shows our breakdown of the uh, districts within the city. As you can see in the top right-hand corner, the large uh, blue uh, section is uh, what we call District 5. And uh, that is the area that contains the uh, largest and uh, densest population. And then here is a breakdown of responses into the districts. And uh, you can see the corresponding uh, light blue in the bottom left corner, 36%. That is District 5. Let's 
So as you can see on this slide, I have given you the uh, uh, number of incidents over the last five years, including the corresponding response times. Uh, response times are a work in progress. Um, we are still working on reducing those times, uh, but we still meet the required standards. Um, so many factors do uh, come into the response times. Uh, and as you can see in 2019, uh, that number is fairly high because that was the first full year in the new fire hall. And then so over the last couple of years, we have uh, done a decent job in reducing that, uh, that time. Remember Victoria Street, the fire department was in Victoria Street for uh, roughly 160 years. So, uh, you know, we did have a lot of time to figure out the fastest way around the city. So we are still working on it and it is a work in progress. This next slide just indicates the number of emergency responses outside of the city and the uh, response times there. So of course we have uh, in 2021, excuse me, it's been a while since 2021. If you hear me say 2022, I apologize. Um, this is just a, a quick chart, reference chart, to show you the amount of property lost in 2021 versus the amount of property that we were able to save. So now we're into our significant incidents for 2021. Uh, if you just want to move to the next slide, please, Sean. So the first significant incident was a 360 Metcalf. Uh, unfortunately, with this incident, uh, there was a large number of uh, pets that lost their, uh, uh, lost their life due to the fire. Uh, the picture on the right is uh, how the, our investigator uh, restructured the kitchen after the fire, after the incident was uh, under control. And on the left, you can see the damage that was uh, uh, sustained on the second floor above the kitchen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 231 McKay Street. Uh, this incident uh, was uh, another uh, kitchen incident. Um, this particular one, I have noted that the fire alarm saved the lives of the uh, people in the building. Uh, these two incidents, they were my uh, actual last two calls as uh, incident commander. So, you know, <laughs> jinx. Uh, that one was uh, six people were displaced, but once again, um, the, the fire alarm was the one that, uh, that uh, the occupant of that apartment, uh, the fire alarm went off in the hall and that notified her of, uh, of uh, the danger and she, uh, everybody managed to escape with no injuries. Uh, 289 Julian Street, uh, this fire uh, originated on the outside of the structure uh, and you can see the bottom picture, that is uh, just a demonstration of, of some of the um, operations we conduct on site during a fire to try to uh, save as much of the uh, tenant's property as we can. And uh, 564 Maple Avenue, this was my first fire as chief. Uh, you can see the picture on the left, that was the uh, occupant's bedroom. Uh, she had, uh, she had uh, lit some candles in there and then uh, decided that the uh, bedroom was too warm, so she moved then to the living room uh, and slept, and uh, our investigators uh, have determined that it was candles that caused the fire. Uh, the picture on the right is the hallway just outside of the, uh, of the bedroom. Uh, so you can see the extent of the damage in the bedroom versus uh, the minor smoke, smoke damage uh, on the hallway uh, on the right. Um, that damage would have been even further reduced had the uh, doors been closed. So as far as vehicle collisions and extrications, uh, the city, uh, the fire department responded to 40 accidents in 2021 uh, and uh, four, 40, four of those 40 accidents required extrication. Uh, two extrication calls were within the city and two were in Laurentian Valley. Uh, that particular incident uh, was uh, an individual was rollerblading on Boundary Road and was struck by a vehicle. Uh, that also too was my call. Um, but that one, there was some issues with uh, dispatching on that one, which, uh, which we've since rectified. 
uh, there were no there were no significant uh, calls for water rescue in 2021. We did respond to three incidents, but uh, they uh, really had no significance. So with this slide, before we go too far into it, uh, I do want to touch on the false alarms. Uh, in uh, 2021, the final number of letters of warning that we sent out was uh, 29. That was uh, slightly higher than uh, 2020 and 2019, uh, but still lower than the previous 2018-2017 uh, numbers. Uh, we uh, did send out seven invoices in 2021, and actually the total is identical to 2020. And you'll notice that the numbers of invoices are different, but that is just because of the way that the uh, fee structure works. And since the introduction of the false alarm bylaw, we have recovered a total of $110,000, roughly. Can you just go back one second slide, Sean? So in the inspections and consultations, um, the majority of these uh, focus on uh, the risks that we've identified uh, within the fire department. So in the uh, report, I've outlined uh, seven of the uh, risks that uh, we feel are priority for our fire service to address when we uh, talk about inspections and uh, public education. Uh, just quickly touch them, uh, malfunctioning or disabled smoke alarms, compliance of fire code and multi-unit apartments, major industry fire loads, senior citizen vulnerability, evacuation of multi-unit dwellings, residential fires, and carbon monoxide poisoning. I'm uh, quite happy with the results that we've seen uh, from uh, numbers one and two. Uh, number three is in very good shape. Uh, the senior citizen vulnerability, I think that's something that we uh, will continue to address moving forward. Uh, evacuation from multi-unit dwellings, um, that has been uh, somewhat successful. Uh, residential fires are obviously moving up the, uh, the list as far as identified risks. So one thing we wanted to, to address uh, with the with the non-working smoke alarms or disabled smoke alarms was our smoke alarm program. And in 2021, we partnered with the Renfrew County Housing Corporation. And that was the main focus of our smoke alarm program. And uh, 160 inspections of uh, Renfrew County housing units were complete. Um, I will we'll touch on our fire cause determination as well. Um, currently, we have only one certified investigator who is Captain Beaupre. In 2022, we are currently working towards having two more members certified uh, so that uh, they can assist Captain Beaupre and uh, sort of relieve some of the pressure on him as well. And of course, too, we want to ensure that we have certified investigators in place whenever uh, Captain Beaupre does de re decide to, uh, to move on. So as far as prevention and education activities, of course, 2021 with the amount of uh, uh, lockdowns we were put in with uh, COVID, it certainly uh, affected our uh, education activities. Uh, one thing I do want to point out when it comes to education uh, activities, um, for the past 12 years, Josh Wormke has donated his time to don the Sparky costume. And uh, the appreciation that uh, our members have for the role that Josh plays and the friendship that he provides us uh, cannot be overstated. Uh, further to that, uh, I will touch quickly on our uh, public service announcements and uh, the launch of our social media uh, sites. Um, they've been uh, quite successful. Uh, I've, we've been working on uh, having um, new messaging going out on our PSAs I, every uh, couple of months. And our, our focus was really on seasonal topics. And uh, the social media development, it, it couldn't have been, uh, couldn't have gone any better. Um, you know, I really have to thank Elijah for uh, assisting me with that. Um, and I would also like to thank uh, some of the uh, downtown businesses that uh, graciously donated some prizes to uh, 
to help us ha hold a couple of uh, launch uh, a launch contest and then a couple other contests throughout the year that really uh, really boosted up our uh, our online uh, profile. So fire prevention week. This year, or in 2021, Fire Prevention Week ran from October 3rd to the 9th, and it was Learn the Sounds of Fire Safety. Uh, we started off with a uh, social media blitz, and uh, we asked all residents to get loud. Uh, kickoff of Fire Prevention Week was at the uh, Pembroke Lumber Kings game, and uh, I'd like to thank Mayor LeMay for joining Sparky and I for the ceremonial puck drop. And uh, the Pembroke Professional Firefighters Association uh, sponsored the Chuck a Puck event. Unfortunately, with COVID, uh, we were very limited as to our access to the schools and the students, but we were still able to get the uh, message of Get Loud out to the students uh, via just morning announcements. Uh, smoke alarm and information booths were held at uh, both malls and they were received quite well. Uh, the smoke alarm exchange, I would say that the number of smoke alarms that we're seeing being exchanged right now are lower. Uh, that tells me that our, uh, our messaging has gotten out and uh, people are aware of, uh, of the, the need to make sure that they have uh, their smoke alarms are within the 10 year lifespan and uh, they are actively uh, looking after them themselves, which is nice to see. And finally, a wrap up of, of Fire Prevention Week was our open house uh, with uh, consultation with the Renfrew County uh, District Health Unit. Uh, we opened up our doors to uh, approximately 300 people. Uh, we did raise food and uh, monetary donations for the Grind and St. Joseph's Food Bank. Uh, this is just an example of some of the uh, training that uh, staff went through in 2021. Of course, uh, we saw the, uh, the standard extrication and uh, our water rescue drills at Kiwanis Pool. Uh, extrication generally occurs in the spring. Uh, the water uh, rescue drills at uh, Kinsman Pool in the fall. Other training items uh, with the uh, closure of the uh, Fire College campus in Gravenhurst. Uh, a lot of staff then enrolled online courses uh, through the Fire College. Uh, the online courses have been challenging to say the least, uh, but staff is persevering through them and uh, results are positive. Uh, it, they are, it, is a, it is a work in progress though. I won't lie, uh, the staff has had difficulties uh, uh, making the adjustment from in-person classes to online learning. Uh, as far as volunteer training goes, our Pembroke volunteer firefighters still train bi-weekly and uh, they follow the NFPA program. Uh, training had been uh, interrupted a couple of times due to lockdowns, uh, but the training uh, that was uh, still uh, in place was intense and productive. And once again, all uh, volunteer training is taught to the expectations at, of NFPA uh, 1001, Firefighter 1 and 2. Uh, on the screen, I uh, have just outlined some of the online courses that staff have taken through 2021. So outlined on the screen now and in the report are the uh, operating costs or the replacement schedule, sorry. On the previous page in the report, you'll see the operating costs for the department uh, apparatus outlined in the report. Uh, the replacement schedule, uh, I have uh, tried to stay with the original, uh, in line with the original 10% savings per year. Uh, however, uh, in discussion with some of the uh, the, um, the salespeople and uh, people in the trade at the uh, Ontario, Fires, uh, Ontario uh, Fire Chiefs Association's trade show in May, um, the last year has seen roughly a 20% increase on a lot of these items that are listed in front of you. So, the fire department would not be uh, what it is if not for the efforts of its members. And of course the members belong to the Pembroke Professional Firefighters Association. Uh, the next several slides, I uh, just wanted to highlight some of the various uh, donations and, uh, and um, organizations they assist throughout the year. On this slide, I'll ask you to note the uh, donation to Muscular Dystrophy Canada 
It's the uh, 57th year the uh, association has supported the organization. Uh, they also sponsor uh, several uh, uh, young families in the city for uh, hockey registration, sports registration, hockey camps at Bishop Smith uh, and Fellows, uh, St. Joseph's Food Bank, of course, the Legion Remembrance Day. The Kiwanis uh, Christmas Toy and Food Drive is another huge event. Uh, the Christmas Angel Program. Of course, Movember is always a big hit at the fire hall. And last but not least, uh, the association is a uh, huge, huge uh, sponsor for the open house event. And uh, I must say, without their sponsorship and without their assistance, uh, I would never be able to, uh, to hold such an event. And I would really like to thank uh, their participation as well as their families for taking the time to, uh, to help me out with that. And this is an example of uh, some of the outreach we've done with uh, other community members. This was the uh, Kojiko uh, Your TV uh, Planting Roots in Our Community event. Um, this certainly has fostered a strong relationship with your TV. Uh, and the one thing that uh, I'm always cognizant of and I would really like to promote is the importance of, uh, of, of, of exhibiting a, a, a good role within the community and uh, really showing um, the importance of being a good community member and uh, fostering these relationships with these organizations within the city. So new and exciting for 2021 uh, with the, uh, the one-time provincial grant of $8,000, uh, we decided to uh, look at uh, training as opposed to inspection, um, assisting our inspections during the pandemic. Um, the, the idea of assisting our inspection program, uh, it wasn't really feasible with the amount of dollars we received. So we looked at, uh, at uh, upgrading the fire hall to be able to provide training within our department without having to uh, reach out to outside organi organizations and, uh, and uh, partnering with other uh, departments during the pandemic, uh, you know, to limit uh, access and uh, restrict people coming in. So we did develop uh, the a rescue window within the hall. Uh, we also developed a forcible entry prop and we uh, purchased a porta tank that really uh, really assists in, uh, in our new firefighters with their uh, pumping operations and learning how to uh, manage the trucks on scene. Uh, and once again in November, uh, Council graciously approved the standardization of SCBAs and the 3M Scott self-contained breathing apparatuses uh, moved forward with the tender. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the new uh, Dodge Ram that came into service in uh, April of 2021. Uh, I used the uh, opportunity during Fire Prevention Week to reach out to the schools and uh, we had a little contest and uh, I thought that it would be a good idea to allow some students to come up with some slogans relative to Fire Prevention Week and uh, these two pictures here are the two winning, winning slogans. And this is something that, uh, that uh, would be reoccurring every fire prevention week. So last but not least, I would uh, like to thank the City of Pembroke for giving me the opportunity to lead such a fantastic and admirable fire department. Uh, 2021 witnessed a division within our community and also too within the fire department over vaccines and mandates. Uh, this will take a tremendous amount of time and effort to recover from. Uh, first and foremost, I think we must remember that we are a community and uh, we can only move forward together. Uh, we as a fire department will strive to create uh, a, and promote positive environment within the city uh, through our activities in 2022. A priority for the fire service uh, was to make sure that we were available when people called upon us. So we did put many policies and procedures in place to prevent the spread of COVID and lessen the chances of our uh, uh, members being affected by an outbreak at the fire hall. Uh, the added vigilance certainly took its toll on our members and I would like to thank all of our members personally for their efforts during those times. 
Uh, the relationships I've developed over the last year have been extremely uh, positive and gratifying, and I look forward to 2022 and would like to thank you for uh, the opportunity to step into this role. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Jackno. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through to the Chief. Uh, as the Vice Chairman of Operations, I took it upon myself to invite uh, the President of the Gulf View uh, Developments, who are building 1,500 homes in the community, to tour your fire hall. And uh, I appreciate you giving us the opportunity. I know you're a busy guy, and I had that cleared through the Mayor's office and through our CAO, because we know you're very busy in your scheduling. And he uh, asked me to express his overall thanks to you and the department. He was truly amazed that, uh, you know, your professionalism uh, exists within a community this size. And he comes from a larger uh, community, of course, just outside of Toronto. Uh, but he was duly impressed. And uh, there are going to be 1,500 new homes built around the corner from your fire department. I mean, that obviously gives any buyer, uh, you know, uh, an advantage when they know that uh, in a moment you're going to be there. It won't be five minutes. You're around the corner. So uh, he was also quite impressed with your equipment, your extrication equipment, and the old stuff that you maintain and keep on hand. Uh, you know, a lot of places will just chuck it, but it shows your uh, frugality as a chief uh, to keeping the uh, taxpayers' uh, money well spent. And uh, he just wanted me to ask to thank you again. And he said, you truly are a professional team. So thank you for allowing us the time to go through there. And uh, hopefully uh, when the buildings are all built, there'll be no fires in them. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions to the chief about this report? At your end? All right. all right. Well, thank you very much for a great report, chief. Uh, we'll finish up now with the monthly report. Okay, this is the long one. Okay. <laughs> uh, so the month of May, um, we're continuing to get back into the schools. Uh, we, we delivered a fire safety talk and demonstration for 25 students at Holy Name. Also during the month of May, the annual training for summer staff uh, takes place. So uh, 20 summer students uh, were uh, instructed on the use of portable fire extinguishers and general fire safety to assist them in their daily duties with the uh, city. Further to that, uh, nine of the marina staff uh, were trained in uh, focusing on handling spills and other emergencies within the marina itself, as well as they're instructed and uh, informed as to what to do when contacted uh, by a boater in distress. Uh, staff training was conducted at Best Western, uh, 32 staff members there. Uh, messaging for the month of May on our, on our PSAs uh, evolved around Emergency Preparedness Week. Uh, reminding community members of our city's open air burning policies and reminding everyone the importance of properly disposing of all smoking materials. Our social media focus was on emergency preparedness week. So emergency preparedness week, this was my first crack at it as a, as a CEMC. Uh, the week ran from May 1st to uh, May 7th. Uh, on May 3rd, Mayor LeMay declared the week as Emergency Preparedness Week in the City of Pembroke. Uh, we joined forces with local media outlets to ensure strong, clear messaging on emergency preparedness was delivered to our community. Our social media pages also delivered messaging following the Canadian Association of Fire Chiefs Topics Guide. Uh, we finished off the week with a quiz with uh, students across the city. Uh, the students uh, did the quiz in class and uh, select students were awarded a, a little prize from a McDonald's, uh, Joe's Family Pizzeria and some uh, fire prevention items. And I'd really like to thank all the schools, the teachers and the students for taking part in this activity. Uh, public relations may also saw uh, the Pembroke Fire Department uh, attend the Community Expo hosted by the P PBIA. Uh, this was uh, well received. Staff said that it was an excellent, uh, an excellent um, opportunity to uh, get out into the community and discuss matters with community members. Look forward to, uh, to being a part of that uh, next year again. And we wrapped up, we tried to get some emergency preparedness uh, information in there as well as uh, fire prevention public education items. And then again, for the first time in a few years, the fire department is uh, 
being invited to the uh, fun nights at the schools. So the fun night season kicked off at the end of May with Champlain Discovery, and there's uh, many more coming up in uh, June. Courses and seminars, uh, staff attended the Ontario Association of Fire Chiefs trade show in Toronto. Captain Calhoun, Captain Morgan continued their NFPA 1031 Fire Inspector 1 course. Acting Captain Zimmerman and Acting Captain Kelly completed the NFPA 1033 Fire Investigators course. It is going to be a while before they're fully certified as they have to uh, meet specific requirements within a calendar year once they, uh, once they complete the, uh, the course portion. Uh, Cap myself and Captain Beaupre uh, completed a course on fire codes part three and five. And Firefighter Lapierre began his uh, fire instructor course. Vulnerable occupancy inspection was conducted at Riverview Heights. Uh, the EOC is continuing to be used with the Seniors Advisory Committee, the Emergency Management Control Group meeting, two training sessions on working from heights, and a very informative training session on grant writing attended by staff from various city departments. Career training for the month of May, the focus was on water rescue techniques, and we had two large scenario uh, training activities uh, held at the marina where firefighters went through the whole uh, uh, rescue technique, beginning with throw, moving to row, and finally to go, where the rescues actually entered the water to effect the rescue. We also continue tours of uh, the various city facilities. And you can see outlined other training sessions. Volunteer training for May focused on water supply, ground ladders, and water rescue. Uh, the volunteers were utilized during our uh, scenario training as well. Consultations, there was 119 consultations uh, for, for the month of May. I apologize about the uh, error there. Uh, three fire safety plans approved. Property fires, uh, you'll see there was four in the month of May. It uh, has been an extremely busy uh, time for us. Uh, 45 total responses for the month of May. Uh, I was looking at the numbers recently. Uh, January, we were slightly below our average response. February, we were right on average response. Uh, March, we were well below our average response uh, numbers. Uh, April and May are, are, have been our busiest uh, years or months in the last five years for April and May. Uh, and in May, four letters of warning were uh, issued. Uh, one fine was issued. Questions to the Chief about this monthly report? Any other comments? Well, then thank you very much, Chief, for coming in. Excellent uh, year-end report, as well as uh, always their monthly updates of what's going on around the city. I know everyone in Pembroke really appreciates having a full-time fire department here and ready at their service. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, next up we'll have, as we've uh, changed the schedule a little bit here, we're on the monthly accounts for January and February, Ms. Lochte. Um, staff is providing the monthly accounts report for the months of January 2022 and February 2022 as an information item and considers them to be in order. Thank you. Are there any questions to Treasurer about the monthly accounts? Seeing none, thank you very much. Next up, the Animal Pound Keeping Services update. Ms. Martin. At the February 1st, 2022 uh, Finance and Administration Committee meeting, a new Animal Pound Keeping Services agreement was presented. The new contract included a new rate for Animal Pound Keeping Services of $361.50 per cat and dog. Um, since that, um, since the 2017 um, Ontario SPCA Animal Pound Keeping Services contract, the City of Pembroke has been paying approximately 40% more per cat than our neighbouring municipalities. Following committee direction, meetings uh, were held with representatives of the Ontario SPCA um, and council members uh, regarding this disparity. Following discussions with the SPCA, they indicated that they would be willing to reduce the City of Pembroke's cost per cat from $361.50 to $195 until new agreements have been negotiated with our neighbouring communities. 
which should occur around August uh, 2023. And then the cost would increase to the new rate as per the new agreement. The new re rate will be the same across all area municipalities. This reduction represents a savings of approximately $166.50 per cat. The Ontario SPCA indicated that they would be willing to reduce our current cost in exchange for Council's support in developing a sustainable cat sterilization program. It is suggested that Council use the savings and also consider an additional matching amount, the $166.50, to introduce a reserve fund for a sustainable cat sterilization program. As the Ontario SPCA will no longer be accepting feral cats, the additional matching amount could be obtained from the savings realized from the shelter services budgeted for cats, which, we would, which would have included the feral cats. The City of Pembroke has a high roaming feral cat population. Histori historically, uh, the City has averaged approximately 50 feral cats per year, which is 37% 30, uh, of the animals impounded each year. These cats are unsocialized and therefore pose challenges to the Ontario SPCA to, to find suitable homes for adoption. The Ontario SPCA would be willing to assist the city in finding alternative strategies to reduce the number of feral cats and find a sustainable approach for its feral cat population management. The SPCA has a mobile spay neuter program that the city ho could host using funds from its feral cat reserve fund. The mobile clinic would cost approximately $5,350 per day, which includes $2,500 per day for the uh, mobile unit, plus uh, $95 per cat for, uh, for the sterilization of approximately 30 cats per day. If committee recommends that a feral cat reserve fund be established, and if committee recommends that the current savings as well as the matching amount be placed into reserve fund, committee could offer approximately three clinics per year. Currently, uh, the SPCA has a clinic, a mobile clinic, uh, planned for uh, June 22nd to the 24th, I believe it is, and one of those days is in Pembroke at the Pembroke Legion. Um, unfortunately, all the spaces have been booked, um, but it would be a similar clinic that the city could host in the future. If a committee is interested in offering a mobile clinic, it'll need to make decisions on the following. Will committee fund um, for its residents with a proof of address required the full cost of a spay neuter service provided at the mobile clinic? Secondly, if the committee does not fund the full cost of a spay neuter service, will committee provide a subsidized program for all residents or subsidize only those residents on a lower fixed income? If only subsidizing for lower fixed income residents, um, there will be a, a concern around privacy in regards to who could perform the needs assessment, the proof of address, as well as income, as the SPCA would not uh, pr provide this service for us. Will committee offer the service free of charge to local rescue groups within the city? And again, proof of residence um, or address would be required. And finally, will committee request that its current animal control provider, which is ProTech 5 Inc., help administer this, no, this new program as far as helping residents um, safely and humanely trap a feral cat and, and assist in transporting it to the mobile clinic. To, to assist in reducing the number of cats being abandoned by pet owners, committee may also wish to consider public education to help change people's behaviors regarding the importance of pet spay-neuter surgeries, the importance of keeping cats indoors where they are safe, and indicating it's not acceptable to leave cats behind or release them in public areas. As the Ontario SPCA will no longer shelter feral cats, Another question for committee is how uh, committee wishes the animal control contractor um, respond to calls regarding feral cats from our city residents. If committee, uh, as far as financial implications, if committee decides to establish a feral cat reserve fund to be used for spay, neuter, mobile clinics or other programs committee wish to become involved in to help reduce the number of feral cats in the city, 
the savings of approximately $8,325 realized between June 15th of this year to August 31st of 2023 for the pound keeping services for cats as well as a matching amount currently budgeted for fees for the sheltering of feral cats could be added to the fund which depending on the number of cats sheltered could amount to approximately approximately $16,000. So this evening, um, I'm looking for uh, direction in regards to the feral cat population within the city and also to, um, to, to have the finance, it's recommended that the Finance and Administration Committee approve the award um, of the amended animal pound keeping services to the Ontario Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals um, with the reduced rate for, uh, guaranteed for one year as long as council um, is willing to step forward and uh, look at a cat sterilization program. Okay, so let's do the, the, the first one is the award of the contract. I think that's an easy one to deal with first. So, Councillor Frenier. So, um, Heidi and I met via Zoom with the members from the SBCA locally and um, the concerns from this committee obviously were the rate that we were being charged to pose to our neighbors and they understood that immediately. Um, I'm glad they came to the table with the reduction. Um, we had further discussions around that reduction and because they are no longer going to provide the feral cat service to us, we are, we're faced with another issue and no matter how you look at it, it's going to be dollars. So what I had said was because we're going to realize savings that perhaps we could put those dollars aside because we normally would have been spending it on our rate anyway. So the dollars we're saving would be put into a separate fund to go towards whatever program uh, city this committee decides to implement. Um, I looked at a video that they shared with me and it's about the trap neuter release program which I think is a great match for our community. I know that I live, um, well, I guess we want to address the contract. So I guess why I'm explaining it is it's kind of contingent on accepting this or signing this contract that we do put that money in a reserve because that was sort of part of the conversation. They said, well, that we would reduce the rate if we knew you were going to be putting that money towards the trap new to release or working with volunteers, that type of thing. So yes, I am encouraging you to support this contract. And then I'll talk about the other issues if you want to talk about them later. Did you want to put a motion on the floor then? I will move that we accept this uh, contract. Okay, second by Councillor Reevee. Okay, then any further comments on the contract only? Seeing none, then I call the question. Those in favor? Approved. So we have the contract approved. Now we'll move on to the feral cat situation. Count, uh, Councillor Abdallah? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Freddy, for meeting with the, the uh, SPCA and Ms. Spartan. Um, I spoke to one of the residents involved in volunteer rescue prog program who there's an there's a individual in Pembroke who work full time and they volunteer and they end up taking the cats out of town. Uh, Ottawa, Montreal, they're all adopted. And so these people are working full time and they can find room for these cats. But Ms. Martin told me today on the phone that they have to be formal, formalized shelters. That's why the SPCA doesn't work with the local ones. So I would like to support um, the three clinics a year is good, but it's not enough. Um, I'd like to support the three clinics a year with subsidized for low income at full cost and some spots for the rescue groups at full cost. And then I'd like the city staff to put out exploratory advertisement to find uh, interest in a TNR, as Councillor mm -hmm. Friendly mentioned, trap, neuter, and release program. We need a public meeting. We need people to come together. There's a problem. We have to deal with it. The, um, it's unfortunate that the SPCA is not taking feral cats anymore. There needs to be a sense of ownership. In speaking with them today, I did phone them. I talked to Amanda. She said that uh, it's not the right environment for them. They get stressed out. There were, there were so many, it was taken up other spaces. Um, there is an adoption program that can be developed, uh, maybe better in Pembroke. Uh, education is free. It's online, Facebook. 
there, it's too bad there's no barn program here. There's, there's nobody around for a barn program. So I would support the uh, three clinics a year, subsidized for low income and uh, rescue groups, and also a TNR program looking at developing that with the public. So that, you know, it's a community problem. It's all about animal welfare, what's best for the cat. These are animals. We are human beings. This problem has been created by members of the community. We need to care of these uh, animals. We need to be humane. Um, where do the animals go if the ProTech pick them up? Do they go to alternate uh, shelters outside of uh, the city? That's a question. The other thing is that um, the TNR program can also be worked out with local veterinary clinics. There's a problem in Pembroke. Some vets aren't taking new patients, and that's a big problem. So those are my points on the uh, topic for now. I might have more to say later. Thank you. Right. Councillor Frenet, followed by Councillor Reevee. So um, the fact that we have a local rescue group, and I think there's probably more than what we know, but I agree with Councillor Abdallah, if we put the word out that we want to work with these rescue groups, I really like the idea of using this money that we're putting aside to spay and or neuter these feral cats and let them be released back out. Because that is the danger, is that they're reproducing, obviously, every year. But if we can release them back into their natural environment, they'll live the way that they want to live, you know, and roam our community. So I, I like that idea. Um, the other one that, that are mentioned here, like the fact of checking uh, income levels, and je that would have to be done by us or another organization. The SPCA is not willing to do that. So that, that may get muddy. So I'm thinking baby steps here, because this is all new to us. But I think for now is to put the word out that we want to work with these rescue groups and see how we can come together on getting the spay neuter tra uh, release program done. Then we can reach out because I think if you're a responsible pet owners, most of them do get their animals spayed or neutered. So once we get a control on the ones that are out there now, the feral cats, <laughs> then maybe we can start to implement other programs. But that's my feeling is I would like to work with the rescue groups to start. Councillor Reevee. I agree with both councillors Abdallah and Lafreniere on uh, everything. Um, we have created this problem and it does come from irresponsible pet ownership. In my mind, every cat, dog is well loved, well fed, well looked after, but unfortunately that's not the way it is. Um, I do agree with setting the funds aside, creating a reserve to deal with, with this, to um, to find our volunteer organizations or people that would, would help us out with that. I'm wondering if, um, if we're looking at the subsidies for lower income individuals to spare and neuter, could we not partner with other groups such as the food bank that does that already and say, hey, could you, <laughs> for lack of a better word, vet? you know, this for us we, and um, put it out with, with their assistance. Maybe that's a, a thought, but I'm glad that, um, that we're looking at moving forward with this because I think it'll just be best for, for everyone, every animal in our community. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So certainly it's been mentioned earlier and we talked about it at different uh, parts of uh, this evening uh, that education is the first and foremost part of it. Um, I noticed this year uh, at the direction of uh, council that uh, there was someone that went door to door to ensure that people did purchase their pet tags. It's, uh, I'll say sad that uh, it, it comes to the fact that uh, the city of Pembroke has to pay someone to go door to door to ensure that people get their pet tags, which will draw me into the next one, which is individuals who purchase pets, and I have two of them, uh, uh, but uh, people who purchase pets uh, and don't spay or neuter. Um, it strikes me that, and I realize we all want things in life and so forth, but animals aren't cheap. Uh, having been to the vet recently with one of mine, they're not cheap. And so uh, I have an issue uh, with uh, trying to uh, uh, 
uh, assist whether anyone inside the city of Pembroke in terms of their pets, feral cats aside, uh, with trying to spay and neuter and assist individuals with spay and neutering. Because if you can't afford to do that, you probably can't afford to get the right medication and otherwise uh, for your animals as well. Um, so if you can't afford it, if I can't afford to have what I'll call toys, motorbikes and whatever, you don't get them. So if you can't afford to have and properly take care of animals, you don't get them. Um, and th that'll sound crass or rude or what have you, but I think it's a reality check for individuals. The feral cats is a different situation. We have pockets, we've known it for some time, pockets of animals in our uh, community. And that's what I'm interested in is the uh, animals in our community, not outside of our community in LV or anywhere else. Uh, unfortunately, some individuals are bringing, I firmly believe they're bringing them to our municipality uh, and then introducing them to different uh, um, the different feral cat communities that are here. So I have no problems with utilizing funds to do this uh, uh, this trap neuter release. Uh, it makes sense that eventually, one would hope, uh, that the, that population will decrease uh, because they, they can't continue to populate. Again, it's... Um, troubling that there are certain individuals I th they they must honestly believe that they're doing well by feeding these these groups but uh, from having I know I've gone with the mayor before uh, to talk to different individuals at the OSPCA and so forth and they said you understand that if they're feeding them and they get healthier then they populate even more so you, you understand that it's 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 uh, it's uh, sort of defeating the, the the purpose of what it is that you're trying to do so I have no issue with setting up a reserve I have no issue with utilizing those funds for the purposes of trying to do the trap neuter release and decrease those feral populations but as to the other individuals um, to me it's enforcement it's it's uh, uh, selling pet tags knowing what's in our particular community and again it's an education piece if you can't afford to have the animal I don't know you put it up for adoption or you just don't get one to begin with but I'm not going to get into trying to utilize funds uh, to try and ensure that everyone can have an animal that wants an animal in this world it's unfortunate but I watched the news earlier uh, today and they're talking about how all the costs are going up and people are going without eating why because they can't afford it well if you can't afford to eat you shouldn't be getting animals too. But. Any other comments? Councillor Abdel? Uh, well, Cornwall have a program. Uh, I mentioned last meeting about the TVO uh, video about the cat problem there in 2020. They have a, sub a subsidized spray neuter program and the residents fill out the app, social housing services review it. The good idea about hope doing it with the grind, and the um, OSPCA contacted book the date for the client. So I still think there's you know people on fixed income and uh, rescue groups should be have some subsidized rate because when you bring a spay neuter clinic to town, the uh, people that are going to book it. You know some of them will have pet. They'll take their pets there. Our goal, they could take their pet to the vet to get spay neutered. Our goal is to deal with the feral cat problem. Mm -hmm. So that's why the spay neuter clinic should be d dedicated to the feral cat problem in the, uh, in the city like Cornwall does. And they also have a TNR program too. Councillor Fenny? I just think maybe we should be setting up a subcommittee of council um, to work on this. And I think it should be step by step. We can't take everything on at once because number one, we don't have the money in the budget <laughs> and we don't have the volunteers and all that type of stuff. So that, that's my recommendation tonight is to approve the contract and I would be happy to sit with someone else. So Brian, if anyway, if it's, and work something out and bring it back. Uh, reach out to the rescue groups, bring that information back and come up with some type of plan. And just a final note, um, I heard Deputy Mayor, and he's absolutely right. Um, if someone has a pet, you know, they should be, be responsible pet owners and do the right thing. Unfortunately, they want a pet for their child and they can't afford it all. And what happens is they have kittens and they release them out wherever because they can't keep all the kittens or they can't give them away. So unfortunately, if we only tackle the feral population and that's it, the problem keeps happening if we don't help these people spay or neuter their animals because they'll just keep sending them out to the streets and we'll continue to have this. So that is something that should come later 
is the subsidies for low income. But I think for now, yeah, we'll work on a plan starting with TNR. Thank you. Councillor Jacko. How do you talk a feral cat into getting neutered? <laughs> That's what I'd like to know. Somebody's got to go trap the cat. I believe yeah. that'll be our, oh, yeah. our, uh, our bylaw enforcement officer or the volunteer Rescue. groups. Rescue and once they're released, they still are a nuisance. They're in your garden. They're in your flower beds. You know, the, the animal is still a nuisance. Uh, sure, they're not going to reproduce, but they're still a nuisance within the community. I don't know if they continue to spray, like cats will spray, so they won't spray, but they'll poop in your garden. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor and the Mount Good Bunch. If I can just ask a question. So one of the items that uh, Ms. Merton has asked us to look at is um, this issue of how does committee wish the city's animal control contractor to respond to calls regarding feral cats. I'm aware of one individual in our community that in his mind is assisting the city of Pembroke and he has taken it upon himself to trap cats mm -hmm. and then he rings. So previously uh, I understand that the cats would go to the OSPCA um, and if and this might sound unfair, but I'm going to throw it back on, on staff. Uh, what is it that is supposed to happen with these animals if the OSPCA won't take them? I guess what I'm asking is it will, and again, this won't sound very fond in people's ears and whatnot, is our animal control contractor prepared to do euthanasia? What What is it that uh, are our options to deal with animals that when a resident X calls and says, got another one, what are we supposed to be doing with them in the immediate time frame? Is there any comment from staff first on that? So there, there, there are various options, and it's up to committee to to decide. Um, one is euthanasia, definitely. Our animal control um, provider will do what committee asks him to do. Um, unfortunately, if we go that route, I think you'll have. Uh, uh, a community that's quite upset. Um, if you look at, and I can only go by what other municipalities are doing, but if you look at the city of Cornwall, they basically tell their residents that they do not pick up stray cats. And um, what happens is they do have a um, spay neuter mobile clinic and they, uh, they let residents know when that's happening. They can make an appointment the resident then, um, with help from the contractor, would help to um, trap safely, humanely, the, the, the cat and bring it to the clinic, have it neutered, spayed, and then it's returned back to the community. It would be similar to what the second part of what you're saying, it would be similar to our present situation. Uh, if I have a raccoon and I catch the raccoon, the city of Pembroke isn't going to deal with the raccoon. I deal with it how I want to deal with it. Okay. <laughs> Do you, okay. Just final comment. I think the committee that would be set up to work with the rescue groups, we would talk to the SBCA again, and we would talk to our animal control, and we'd come up with a plan that would work. So, Councillor Bell, final comment. Well, you know, we're all human beings, and I would never support Protect Five giving them permission to go kill a cat when there are other venues, adoption services. Other, they, they can be sent to other SPCA shelters outside of town, possibly. These are all things we can explore. The, um, I was told today the SPCA is, an, is a non-kill facility. That's what I was told. I would never support that. These things are human beings. They're not human beings, they're animals. <laughs> We're human beings. So that's, that's not on the table. Okay, so there's been lots of comments around the table. I think we're, just to summarize a few of points, I think we're all in agreement that we need to set aside a reserve fund. I believe we're all in agreement that we want to look at a TNR program in the future, and I believe, and setting up these uh, Spain Inter clinics, just where we're the knocking heads a little bit is where who's exactly, if it's fully cost covered or funded, or if it's pay, uh, pay to play. Um, so, I believe there's been an, uh, put on the floor possibly setting up a council uh, committee, you know, to further discover, uh, talk about this. So I guess that work with staff and come back and maybe we can present something in the future to council. We can make a final decision. That's enough and head nods around the table. Great. Okay. So move on to the next uh, item then. Half masting and raising a flag policy. Ms. Martin.
sorry, I had, I lost it. Um, at the April 5th uh, Finance and Administration Committee meeting, um, the half-masting and raising of flag policy was discussed. The draft policy outlines the circumstances under which the city will fly its flags at half-mast, sets out the procedure to recognize a visit by a dignitary, and addresses the flying of community flags. A concern was raised at, the, at that meeting regarding flying the national flag upon um, uh, the death of a current or former member of uh, Pembroke City Council and upon the death of a present day employee of the Corporation of the City of Pembroke, and I should qualify that, that would be flying it at half mast. Staff was asked to contact the local MPE office to obtain further information regarding the lowering of the Canadian flag. The draft policy was developed following the order of precedence established by Canadian Heritage, the National Flag of Canada etiquette and rules for flying the National Flag of Canada. The rules for flying the National Flag of Canada has a subsection for half masking the flag which has, further, which has a further subsection with the rules for half masking the National Flag of Canada. The Government of Canada adopted the rules for half masking the national flag to establish a con consistent approach to half masking the national flag at all federal buildings and installations. The rules are not mandatory beyond the federal government and other jurisdictions and organizations may have their own protocols. The Government of Canada's half masking protocols serve as guidelines when expressing a collective sense of sorrow during a time of mourning. In speaking with our local MP's office, they indicated that once the federal guidelines are followed, Council can establish their own protocols regarding the loss of current and former members of Council and staff. Since the draft half-masking and raising of uh, flag policy was written in April, there is a slight change that has been made to the policy. An additional bracket um, is in the process of being installed to the front of City Hall, allowing for the Canadian flag, the provincial flag and the city flag to be permanently displayed and the new bracket will provide an area for approved community flags to be uh, temporarily flown. There's no financial impact associated with this report, uh, but direction is just um, uh, sought in regards to a finalized version so that a, um, the finalized version can come before Council for adoption. Councillor Reavy. Mr. Chair, I think it's a very sound policy. Um, I've been through it a couple times and uh, I think it will stand the test of time. Um, I didn't see anything in my opinion, that was missing. If you need an answer as to what to do with the flags, it's within this policy. So um, good work and, and I'm thrilled with it. Thank you. Any other comments on the draft policy presented? Seeing none, then I would say that everyone is in agreement that they've read through and have no issues. Okay, moving on. Uh, Last item then would be supply and delivery of one current year backhoe loader request. Proposal number P22-02, Mr. Lewis. Welcome to the table. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Operations Department recommends that committee approve the award of the supply and delivery of one current year backhoe loader request for proposal number P-22-02 to J.R. Brisson Equipment in the amount of $122,737 plus HST. The RFP was publicly advertised. It closed on April 7, 2022, with two proponents submitting packages. <clears throat> the proposals were reviewed and evaluated by a panel of three, consisting of the Supervisor of Roads and Fleet, Subforeman of Roads and Fleet, and the Chief Mechanic. All scoring was done individually by the panel members, and the compiling of scoring was monitored by the Purchasing Manager, Deputy Treasurer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Proposals were reviewed and evaluated in accordance with the predetermined criteria that is detailed in the report. The recommendation for award was derived by using a bang for your buck approach. Each proposal was scored on the technical merit, excluding any consideration of cost. Then the total score for each proposal was divided by the proposal cost to obtain a points per dollar measurement. The proposal with the greatest points per dollar was selected as it represents the greatest value for the corporation. Summary of the scores is provided in the attached table one. And for ease of, ease of use, the value is represented in points per 10,000. Based on the review, the Evaluation Committee believes the proposal from J.R. Brisson Equipment offers the best value for this purchase. In the 2022 budget, 167,700 was allocated for this purchase. 
J.R. Bresol submitted a price of 152737 Subtract from that $30,000 trade-in value, representing a total price of 122737 Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councillor Lafrenia. I would move we approve the recommendation to approve the award of supply and delivery of one current year backhoe loader to J.R. Brisson equipment as presented. Councillor Jackano. Seconded. Those further questions, comments? Say none. Those in favour? Approved. And motion to adjourn. Councillor Dalla, Councillor Revy, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.
I'd like to call this council meeting of Tuesday, June the 7th, 2022 to order. Before opening this meeting of council, I'd ask those who wish, each in your own way, silently join in a prayer of guidance over these proceedings. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest and general nature thereof? Seeing none. In regards to minutes, approve the minutes from our regular council meeting, which was held on May the 17th, 2022. Moved by Councillor Jackano, seconded by Councillor Plummer. All those in favor? Carried. Adopt the minutes from committee. Uh, the Planning and Development Committee meeting, which was held on May the 3rd, 2022, moved by Councillor Reevey, second by Councillor Plummer. Those in favor? Carried. The Finance and Administration Committee meeting, which was held on May the 3rd, 2022, moved by uh, the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Plummer. All those in favor? Thank you. The Striking Committee meeting, which was held on December the 21st, 2021, Moved by Councillor Abdallah, seconded by Councillor Reevey. Those in favor? Carried. Receiving the minutes from the Pembroke Public Library Board of April the 21st, 2022, the Climate Action Advisory Committee of February the 22nd, 2022, March 29th, 2022, and April 26th, 2022. Moved by Councillor Giacono, seconded by Councillor Palmer. Those in favor? Carried. Proclamations, by the virtue of the power vested in me, I do hereby declare June 2022 as Stroke Awareness Month in the City of Pembroke. Whereas June is Stroke Awareness Month in Canada, a time to raise awareness of the signs and symptoms of stroke in newborns to the aged population and how to act fast in this medical emergency. And whereas the Western Champlain District Stroke Center based at the Pembroke Regional Hospital, is accountable to provide leadership, development, implementation, and integration of stroke care throughout their district and across all points in the spectrum of stroke care. And whereas we are raising awareness of stroke month and the signs and symptoms of stroke through a social media campaign, and whereas the Pembroke Regional Hospital, in association with Top Dog Fundraising and the Champlain Regional Stroke Network, will be facilitating a virtual trivia night with proceeds going to the Care for Stroke Peer Support Group of Renfrew County. Therefore, be it resolved that I, Michael LeMay, Mayor of the City of Pembroke, do hereby proclaim the month of June as Stroke Awareness Month in the City of Pembroke, dated in the Mayor's office the 7th day of June, 2022. By virtue of the power vested in me, I do hereby declare June 2022 as National Indigenous History Month and June the 21st as National Indigenous Peoples Day in the City of Pembroke. Whereas the Government of Canada acknowledges June as National Indigenous History Month and National Indigenous Peoples Day on June the 21st, as a way to honor the history, heritage, and diversity of Indigenous peoples in Canada, as well as recognize the strength of present-day Indigenous communities. And whereas National Indigenous History Month and National Indigenous Peoples Day is a wonderful opportunity to become better acquainted with the cultural diversity of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples, and to discover the unique accomplishments of Indigenous peoples. And whereas the city of Pembroke is a community that celebrates its cultural diversity, therefore be it resolved that I, Michael LeMay, Mayor of the city of Pembroke, do hereby proclaim the month of June 2022 as National Indigenous History Month and June the 21st, 2022 as National Indigenous Peoples Day in the city of Pembroke and urge all residents to take this opportunity to celebrate and recognize the contributions of the Indigenous peoples to our communities and country. Dated in the Mayor's office the 7th day of June, 2022. Now this proclamation and the flying of the Pequagoon flag, which will begin on uh, June the 9th, are symbols of respect for the, Algonquins, for the Algonquin people on whose land we reside. And it is uh, to honor the rich culture, 
the history and the contributions of the Indigenous people to Canada, our province, and also our community. Bylaws 2022-43, Councillor Reby. Thank you, Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Deputy Mayor Gervais, that bylaw 2022-43 a bylaw to authorize the mayor and chief administrative officer to enter into an agreement with Burcom Developments be adopted and passed. And further that the said bylaw be signed by the mayor and clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Comments? Uh, Your Worship, at the uh, May 17th Operations Committee, we did uh, discuss the um, um, this Burcom development and uh, recognize that they had spent a significant amount of money to date and that we would uh, we would allow them more time. Okay, thank you. Those in favor? Carried. Uh, bylaw 2022-44, Councillor Reavy. Thank you. Moved by myself, seconded by Deputy Mayor Gervais. That bylaw 2022-44, a bylaw to amend the conditions of the approval of Phase 1 of the Gulf View Land Development Inc. Plan of Subdivision in the City of Pembroke be adopted and passed, and further that the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Thank you. No comments? Those in favour? Carried. Bylaw 2022-45, Councillor Reby. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Deputy Mayor Gervais, that bylaw 2022-45, a bylaw to authorize the amendment of zoning bylaw 2020-05 regarding 306 Willard Street be adopted and passed, and further that the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Thank you. Comments? Uh, this was the um, application during the public meeting earlier this evening. Thank you. Those in favor? Carried. The 2022-46, Councillor Plummer. Thank you, Worship. Move myself, second by Councillor Jackano, the bylaw 2022-46, a bylaw to set tax rate reductions for prescribed property subclass for municipal purposes for the year of 2022 be adopted and passed. And for, further, the said bylaw be signed by the mayor and clerk and seal the seal of the corporation. Thank you. Any comments? Yes, uh, Your Worship. This is a bylaw to set tax rate reduction for prescribed subclass municipal uh, purposes for 2022. Section 313 of the Municipal Act requires Council to pass a bylaw each year to establish tax rate reductions for prescribed property subclasses. The subclasses are for vacant or excess land in the commercial and industrial classes. On December 17, 2019, the Council of the City of Pembroke adopted a, a resolution to uh, point phase out subclass reductions for vacant and excess lands in the commercial subclass by reducing the reductions from 30%, 20%, and 10% in 2020 and 2021, respectively. Phase out subclass reductions for vacant and excess land in the industrial class by reducing the reductions from 35% to 25% and 15% in 2020 and 2021, respectively and eliminate reductions for vacant and excess lands in both commercial and industrial classes in 2022 and beyond. The city has uh, received notification from the province approving these changes on July 7, 2022. Or 2020, sorry. Thank you. Those in favor? Okay, carried. Uh, the 2022-47 tax rate, Councillor Jackano. Thank you, Your Worship. Members of Council, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Plummer. At bylaw 2022-47, uh, bylaw to provide for a tax levy for the City of Pembroke for the year 2022 and to establish tax rates to raise same be adopted and passed, and further that the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation and awaiting your signature, Your Worship. Comments? Yes, Your Worship, this bylaw establishes tax rates uh, based on the tax levy that was adopted for the 2022 budget that Council deliberated. It also sets uh, tax bill due dates and identifies penalty and interest rates for arrears. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Those in favour? Carried. Resolution 2022-010, Councillor Lafreniere. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Andrew Plummer. Be it resolved that the Corporation of the City of Pembroke approves the application from Sleepwell Property Management at 75 Pembroke Street West under the Community Improvement Plan. 
The applicant must comply with grant guidelines of the Downtown Heritage Facade Improvement Grant and will have 18 months to complete all work and submit receipts in order to receive the grant. The grant total awarded to this applicant is $5,000. Thank you. Any comments? No. All those in favor? Get carried. Thank you. Uh, Mayor's report. I want to thank the Pembroke Pride and the Renfrew County Chapter of the PFLAG for providing events during Pride Month. I know that members of our LGBTQ2S plus community are very appreciative of the activities that were and are being held during the month of June. COVID-19, Calvid and Wesley United Churches in Pembroke, in partnership with the City of Pembroke, are holding a recognition ceremony to thank all essential workers in our community. The ceremony will be held on Sunday, June the 12th at 1 p.m. at the Pembroke Waterfront Amphitheater. Uh, again, a reminder that COVID-19 is still with us, so please, everyone, stay safe. Any notice of motion? Seeing none, notice, I'm uh, sorry, Councillor reports. Uh, Councillor Abdalla. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. I have a few things tonight. First of all, on behalf of uh, Deputy Mayor Gervais and myself, the Pembroke Community Garden is very appreciative of local residents who have donated plants to go towards planning for the food bank. We received many donations. In fact, uh, I was contacted yesterday by someone who we couldn't take them, so I recommended they contact Orange Valley or the Pembroke Public Library. The Friends of the Public Library are having a plant sale in a week, in about 10 days, and they can donate them there also. So it just shows you the sense of community that we have in Pembroke. Our rain barrel sales are uh, done. I want to thank uh, all the people that purchased 115 rain barrels plus two composters and other accessories. And I want to thank uh, all the volunteers who showed up to distribute them at PEMIX2. Mayor Jackano showed up and Deputy Mayor was there, of course. We had a great time, shared some laughs, shared some memories. And Count, together, Councillor Jackano, sorry. Well, Councillor Jackano, uh, sorry. Point of order. Sorry, Councillor Jackano. Thank you. I've known you so long. No offense there, Mayor LeMay. I could have said Councillor Abdallah, maybe. In fact, my dad, eh, if I was, wasn't thinking straight. Anyhow, getting back to the process here, we raised $1,154. So we're going to do it again next year. It was a great success. Um, I have a report from the Heritage Mural Committee. Uh, for council. The Heritage Murals Committee would like to report that the new timbers will be installed at the Timber Raft Mural later this month by Walsh Brother Construction. It's unfortunate the demise of the original timbers has been hastened by vandalism. Vandalism in many forms has been the norm since 2016. The one-of-a-kind mural stands at the grand entrance to Pembroke's beautiful waterfront developed at the request of Council in 2002 and installed with the donations in kind, valued at the time of approximately $50,000 and numerous volunteers in 2004. Regrettably, the committee has decided to remove the pioneers of Pembroke Township, 1820 to 1850 mural and have the panels stored until the Auto Valley Historical Society has the museum's roof repaired. This unpre unprecedented decision has not been taken lightly. It makes economic sense to remove it before it becomes unsalvageable. Unsalv Store it over the winter, reinstall the panels, then have it completely restored in place after repairs to the roof have been made. Restoration would take a month. The Auto Valley Historical Society Board of Directors asked Heritage Murals to develop a mural for the east side of the museum in 2002 to enhance the appearance of the building. The subject was researched and developed specifically to fit the museum's artifacts and many stories it tells of the community. It was installed in 2008. And the, the last thing I have is uh, not just a personal, on a personal level, but uh, we have a business downtown and a businesswoman, Carrie Yates, uh, which is closing at the end of June. And I want to read the uh, article from the uh, downtown newsletter that everyone receives who is associated with downtown. 
Goldstream Jewelers closing their doors. After over 65 years downtown, Goldstream Jewelers will be closing the doors for good this spring. With the retirement of owner-operator Carrie Yates comes the closing of this family business. And this is an article I, I wrote, a quote I wrote for them. It has been a very close and caring relationship I've been so blessed to share with the Yates family for over 55 years. Goldstream Jewelers has been in business for 70 years and have proudly earned a reputation for honesty and quality. Generations of families always trusted Ken, Dave, and Carrie with their purchases of gifts, watches, jewelry, and especially diamond rings for those special weddings and anniversaries. Carrie has steadfastly carried on the compassionate and professional service and principles that their store has stood for for all these years. Her calm, caring smile is always there to greet you in her relaxing and her relaxing sales style and industry knowledge puts all the customers at ease, knowing that they are in the right place. Yes, we are losing an, an iconic local family business in downtown Pembroke, and we will dearly miss Carrie and Goldstream Jewelers and their staff. Some might say that it's the end of an era. However, it's the beginning of a new era for Carrie as she moves on to the next chapter in her life. We are very proud of Carrie for operating a very successful business through the years and providing a wonderful service to our community. So many memories to share us. All the best, Carrie. No, I wrote that part of it, but this is from the PBA chair, Janet Forte. Carrie and staff have been part of our downtown family for over 65 years and have been pillars of our community. They will, greatly admit, they will be greatly missed in our downtown core, and we wish them all the best in their future endeavors. Happy retirement. So, you know, um, I've known the family all my life. David uh, passed away a number of years ago. Very sad, Carrie took over. Everyone remembers Ken Yates, you know, and he was a big flag person. You know, all the flags were flying around Pembroke. Ken Yates and uh, getting the kids to not walk on the ice and boy, the Boy Scouts and everything. So big impact on Pembroke and they're gonna be missed dearly. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, any other uh, council comments? Seeing none, uh, we'll be moving into closed session, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Reavy, that this meeting become a closed meeting to discuss a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board and a position, plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board. Thank you. Those in favour? Okay, we'll now move to closed session. Thank you, everyone.